uh, and a, a formal welcome to the Asserting Identity in Children and Youth Literature Workshop. I'm Brenda Randolph, Outreach Director at the Center for African Studies at Howard University. Our co-hosts are Vanessa Yuki, co-director at the center, Helen Bond from the School of Education at Howard, and Susan Douglas from Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown. Uh, you know, we have been collaborating on children and young adult literature workshops from our respective world areas, Africa and the Middle East, since 2015. Yes. But this, of course, is our first virtual workshop and as we uh, kind of have discovered through the COVID crisis, it does provide an opportunity to meet more educators. We have a wonderful uh, lineup of speakers today, including, wave your hands, two 2021 winners of the Children's Africana Book Award, Aya Khalil and Trisha Elam Walker. We're so happy to have them here today. Uh, it, you know, in the past, we have always provided gift books to the workshop attendees and COVID has made this really challenging. So uh, our co-director at Howard, Vanessa Yugi, will explain how the gift book program will work this year. I am muted. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> yes, usually we hand the books to you in person, but unfortunately this year it's not possible, but we are happy to be collaborating with, with the Howard University Bookstore, and that's how we will get the books to you this year. So each of you will get a chance to choose a book by filling out our evaluation form at the conclusion of the workshop. And then the bookstore will, we will gather your addresses and the bookstore will mail the titles after the workshop. So Susan will tell you now a little bit more about the resource packet that you will find and that you'll be able to access after and during this workshop. Okay, we as always have a, um, a packet of resources from the books that we have, um, lists of books, including the World Area Book Awards, and we will be sharing that, uh, that link in the chat. Um, you can access that, anyone with the link can access it and, and download the materials, so we'll be sharing that a little bit later as the presentations go on. Helen, would you uh, tell the audience a little bit about how the Q&A will work? Absolutely, thank you. Welcome to everyone this morning. Uh, we will be having a Q&A, so you will get a chance to talk and ask questions, primarily in one of two ways. <clears throat> you can type your questions in after the, uh, after the speaker in the chat area. If you would like to actually speak your <coughs> question so we can hear your wonderful voice, you can indicate when you type your question in the chat indicate in parentheses that you would also like to speak the question and I'll facilitate that. Uh, in the interim, uh, please stay muted. And when presenters are speaking, if you would uh, turn off your camera to give maximum capacity for Wi-Fi, we'd certainly appreciate that. So welcome to all, thank you. Thank you, Helen. So it is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you all our first presenter, Dr. Mohammed. Frazier Rahim. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Intelligence and Security Studies at the Citadel and a lecturer at Howard University. He's an expert on violent extre extremism issues, both domestically and overseas, and Africana affairs and history. Dr. Frazier Rahim's areas of specialty are transnational terrorist movements, counterterrorism, Islamic intellectual history, Islam in, in America, and contemporary theology in the Muslim world and African affairs. Please welcome Mohammed Fraser Rahim. Great, thank you so much. Um, just gonna do a comms check because those things are always important. Um, I hope everyone can hear me clear, good, thumbs up, wonderful. Um, so for the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna make sure I have my stopwatch. Um, I want us to go on a journey. And that journey is going to be partially me sharing my screen and showing you this, which is a, a wonderful, um, I think, uh, indication of um, or an effort that I did in Charleston, South Carolina, where I was born and raised, of enslaved and freed African Muslims, um, spiritual wafers in the South and the Low Country. So throughout this conversation, I'm going to be doing a few show and tells. I'm going to be going to the side and grabbing items. 
because I think this is important, and particularly as it relates to this conversation today. So this exhibit, I think, is a great resource. So all available to you all, you can engage with the organizers who will be able to provide you the, the direct link at any time for you all. So I think it's important to look at the context of Africa um, as a diverse continent. Knowledge, language, imagery, visuals that are absolutely important to understand what a culture is. It's no different than if you go to Europe, if you go to Latin America, et cetera. And so this particular exhibit, I think is very timely because what it situates and in, in, in also is a great resource for you all is to be able to look at the context of religious diversity in West Africa. And I highlight as a product of Howard University where I did my doctorate, that it's important to recognize that when we talk about religious diversity, we're not just talking about the Abrahamic faith traditions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, but we're also talking about African traditional religions, African ways of being, African knowledge consumption. So for you all on this call, this is important because as a young boy, I remember hearing things like uh, go to Timbuktu as though a long distant place, but there are other locations in Niger and Chad and Nigeria and Senegal that had equal centers of knowledge as well. So these are just some of the images. I would highly encourage you to take a look. If you look at the screen right here, this Marabout, an individual who's a religious uh, teacher, just the way you might be learning in school right now and teachers as well engaging in how we teach and looking for new technology in the COVID era. This right here, I don't know if you're able to see, um, Dr. Ayugi, are they able to see me as well at the same time or is it just the screen? They can see you as well. Wonderful. So this right here looks very similar to what you might see right down on that screen right here. As a young boy growing up in Charleston, South Carolina, as a descendant of Gullah Geechee, individuals who were able to preserve their knowledge there in, in language and culture and, and, and religious practices coming over to the new world, which we'll see in a second. This right here is an example of how young people would learn in West Africa. As a young person, I learned Arabic language and was able to, would have definitely did not, um, I've been able to use, and I have multiple boards where I've written on Arabic um, 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 tablets or use tablets where I can write an Arabic script. But this right here is a historical way of engaging and learning. And I think that this is important as we think about and expand our understanding of how we see knowledge and development as well. So you see, this is just another board too as well. Very similar in this case in Sudan above here. This likely was in West Africa. I think the notation says- May I help from the, you? From the British library as well. So right here, I also want to highlight as well, that's also very important, is talking about the role of religion and also enslavement, particularly in the low country of South Carolina and Georgia, is that religion was a means for preservation. We oftentimes, when we think about tradition, particularly in the sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia, we talk about enslaved people that in some way that they, were able, that they lost all of their knowledge, that they lost all of their food practices, and ways of being, but we know that the South Carolina economy was developed and cultivated because technical skill sets from these individuals coming from largely Senegambia, but broader West Africa as a whole, bringing them technical expertise because they were used to the similar cultivation of rice and production. So too, we have in the form of religious education and forms of different ways of being or understanding uh, the world. And so obviously this work that I've done right here is highlighting richly the long tradition in Islamic education, but also very much as I've highlighted before, the rich diversity of broader African religions. And then also, which is very important, is that how we know Abrahamic faith traditions and other practices, but also how they merge and they fuse. Right here is just an example. Again, this is as a, here is a resource for you all just trying to top, uh, bring forward some of the bigger trends and thoughts on this as well. The praise houses, if you go through any of the, of the low country and particularly, in, again, South Carolina corridor, 
you see individuals who were able to find refuge in what we call Looks like we lost Muhammad. I think that's what happened. Let's see. Well, what we can do until he gets back is perhaps just move on to the next section of this workshop where I would show you a few resources that the center has. Let's see if he gets back in the next minute or so. Otherwise, I'll get started. Vanessa and your video is off. Yes, let me restart that. Okay. Oh yeah, he says he got bumped off and he's trying to join back. All right, well, let me go ahead and do this. Let me share with this, the screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Yes. So the Center for African Studies has launched a new and improved website that is a useful resource for exploring West African Muslims in the U.S. And um, this was we were thinking of, you know, introducing this to you after Dr. Muhammad's presentation, but then you'll have an idea of what he'll be talking to uh, talking about as well. So the website is called the Discover Africa in the World, and you can reach it through our center website by going here to Outreach. And we click on, let me actually show you, so here's the best way to access it, Discover Africa in the World, and begin experience. And this is the URL if you want to get directly to it, discoverafricanintheworld.org. So you can use the site for so much more. You're able to choose from these eight regions. Now, um, some of them are not as populated as the, US, as the US is, but you're able to choose from these eight regions to show Africa-related sites that are beyond the African continent itself. And it, it provides a way to explore Africa in your own communities and in other parts of the world. So this is not as populated as you can see in, in Middle East and Oceania and the Caribbean and Canada, but we've heavily worked on the United States first. Um, and we invite you also to suggest sites as a way to suggest a site yourself in your own community. So if you drive by a particular restaurant that tells you a lot about African culture, uh, maybe an Ethiopian rest restaurant in, in DC is a, quite, um, you, you cite quite often, you can come here and suggest a site and put your name and email and we will list that as well. But what I wanted to do today is to search for information on Omar Ibn Said, who I, I imagine Dr. Muhammad was going to talk about. And what you can do here is click on list of locations. There are different ways you can maneuver around this site, but if you clicked on, click on list of locations and you know that's who you're looking for, you can use the control F or the command F function. So since I have a Mac, I'll use the command F. And since I've already been looking for him, his name pops up and I press enter. And then I can see, huh, this in North Carolina, these are the two entries that are there. So let me click on Omar Ibn Said. And here we have a little bit of a description and we have a marker here in Fayetteville, um, North Carolina, where he lived. As you can see here, it says Muslim slave and scholar, African born, he penned autobiography in Arabic in 1831 and lived in Bladen County and worshiped with local Presbyterians. So we typically have a little bit of a description here, a text and resources that you can use to, you and your students can use kind of delve into the topic. And um, as you will hear from Dr. Frazier, here are some of actually his, his articles, the one that he was just showing you here, and also a workbook by Jonathan Green that I'm sure uh, Dr. Frazier will talk more about, but just to show you here, it's quite beautiful. And this is online, so you can actually access this on the internet, take a look. And I'm sure many of you know the artist Jonathan Green, quite a beautiful work. And you can download this. And uh, this is uh, Brenda. I just wanted to, this, this kind of all connects together because 
especially with the book that we're going to talk about, the Arabic quilt mm -hmm. and the Im young immigrant girl coming in who speaks Arabic. We did want people to know that uh, the first, uh, you know, people who wrote in Arabic uh, came from West Africa to the United States. And uh, Omar Ibn Said is just one of these uh, early West Africans who were enslaved and brought to the US and quite a dramatic story he has about running away and writing in Arabic on the, the walls of a jail. And then they're trying to decipher what he was, what he was writing. But uh, yeah, then I think Vanessa has something else to, to show, but that's kind of how it all connects with what we're doing later. Yes, exactly. And another resource we wanted to just draw your attention to is here on the website as well. Here's where we have some of our resources where today we'll not talk about the gold road, but there'll be plenty of opportunities to do that in the future. We just talked about discover and here are some of our lesson plans. And the one that I wanted to show you today is this one, voices of early West African Muslims in the US. Unfortunately, there's an image that usually shows here that's not showing today. Um, this is an activity that we've used in person quite a bit. It's a role play activity with cards, with beautiful cards. And now we'll show you what they look like. Um, we haven't used this yet, vir yet virtually, haven't figured out the best way to use this, but it's been, um, it's been very helpful. Let me actually go back to the, so there are instructions on how you could make these at home. This is what the fronts look like. and. Here are the seven folks that we talk about. Omar Ibn Said is the first one. Sadi Bilali, Ayuba Jalo, Yara Mahmoud, Nicholas Said. So you can print these out and print the backs out and kind of, uh, we have instructions on how you can put these together. And so we've used this in person and you can imagine how, um, how that can, how easily that can lend itself for kids to learn about some of a few facts of, the, of these West African Muslims lives. We tried to keep the text very short in most cases. And um, another thing we have here that you can use are the listening organizers where you can have, um, as, as people are reading maybe their quotes out loud to the rest of the group. The others can take some notes. So there are different ways you can use this in the classroom. So we made a few of these listening organizers that can be useful as, as you learn about these early Muslims, early West African Muslims in the US. So these are the two resources we wanted to show you. Of course, we have some more on our center website, but we thought these were the most important for today. And now is, is Dr. Mohammed Fraser Rahim I with us again? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we do. I'm so sorry. This is the third laptop. It's COVID time, so thank you for being um, flexible and adjusting. Actually, if you, um, if it's just a little easier to as well, could you um, just manage the PowerPoint, uh, the LDHI uh, website for me, real quick? Sure. Is it from the link that you sent on yeah, the email? Yeah, that'd oh, be okay. easier. Yeah. All right, give me a quick second. So I'll go ahead and um, continue. Again, apologies for this. Um, obviously, a lot's uh, going on with the era that we're, we're in. But I think the most important thing to highlight, particularly as it relates to this, is that this knowledge development, particularly coming out of West Africa, is also developing what I call a, um, a, a uniquely African flavor of what Islam is. Thank you so much. Um, if we just go to the religion and enslavement in the low country part. Um, and, and so this is, I think, really important because this helps us situate, you know, growing up in Charleston, this understanding of when we talk about religious pluralism, oftentimes we assume just um, uh, the Abrahamic faith, but there are multiple traditions. And then even within faith, for example, in the context of Islam, we have a deep level of spirituality that's developed. So I think what I've highlighted certainly will cap and certainly captured some of this. So we just go back to the top and I think then we can go into um, enslaved Muslims in the, in the, actually, yeah, the enslaved Muslims in the historical period. And so I think this is also very important because um, people ask all the time. I mean, we know there's on the back of my library, what do I have? We have um, the wonderful book dot by um, uh, Dr. Spellberg who talks about Thomas Jefferson himself. 
who enslaved Africans by the name of Fatima, Fatumatu, Fatimeer. If we go to the five African Muslims and the experiences in the American South, we have key personalities. And so I have been working closely and I'm trying to weave through this in a seamless way. If you, if you don't mind, Dr. Ayugi, if we could go to the five African Muslims, is that um, it's very important that when we look at just these personalities, one might ask the question, where do they, where do we, where do we get their manuscripts? This right here to the left, we have the works of Omar Ibn Said, who the Library of Congress has his work. In 1807, he arrives into Charleston, South Carolina. I happen to be part of an effort where I have been advising on an opera on Omar Ibn Said. This right here happens to be a coloring book. The Spoleto Arts Festival is an annual festival. For the past two years, we've been trying to have the opera down in Charleston, but because of COVID, there's been disruption. And as a result, we've had to postpone. But I have worked on the libretto, the opera, um, the, uh, an opera score to make sure that the historical accuracy is preserved. And so how do we tell these stories? Of course, it's an opera. So it's fusing art and culture and history. And so in this, the wonderful acclaim artist, Jonathan, um, Jonathan Green has did a wonderful imagery of this. You'll be able to see this. You have this as a resource and it has a different scene in which o um, Omar was certainly, um, 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 certainly um, certain items that he had to deal with. It talks about his journey into the new world as well. And so highly encourage you to take a look at this. But if you go to this, I don't know if we can um, go to the next screen to see if we can find the element of the, there we go, there, right there. This is Arabic language. Now for Arabic, it has three vowel marks. A fat, essentially a a, e, u. I'm simplifying uh, language, right? And we have linguists on this call. But in fact, what, and I happen to be by my library, so this is really important. We also have what I would characterize as Arabic language that, um, excuse me, um, African languages in many locations who have rich oral traditions that might not have, have had a language, a written language. And so with the fusion of faith and then also language, we get a merger. And so oftentimes we hear individuals who mention and say, well, this is Arabic language, that that is the stopping point. When particularly when you look at Islam coming down after the seventh century into the, uh, into the Iberian Peninsula, which is Southern Spain, going to places like Mauritania and Senegal, um, et cetera. And what I think is important scholars who have written extensively on this, that what these African thinkers, minds, ordinary, excuse me, extraordinary, but also just very ordinary, who are able to bring in enrichment to the Arabic language. So Swahili language has more than three vowel marks. We have many scholars on this call, right? You have, Wolof that has more than three vowel marks. You have uh, Hausa. So in many respects, these African thinkers were able to bring an enrichment onto African language. Right here below is Omar Ibn Said's um, name. So I think it's important if we go back to the LDHI um, site is that what these individuals were able to bring about, which I think is increasingly important, right? And I just named just a few, right? There are just, you have Wolof Ajami, you have, which is Ajami means non-Arab. You have Swahili Ajami, right? These individuals were bringing in an enrichment of the Arabic language. They were able to bring and introduce and offer an additional way of, of knowledge consumption. So, you know, this is a really important because what you have are individuals who, in the case of Suleiman Jallo, in the case of Ibrahim Abdurrahman, in the case of Omar Ibn Said, are individuals who were deeply committed toward their past, but also the future as well. Yaro Mahmoud, who's very important in the context in, 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 in Washington, D.C. area, we were able to, while I was a graduate student at Howard, we were able to engage in an effort where we were able to preserve his, um, where we were looking for his grave. I collaborated with the DC Archaeological 
um, uh, office. And we were able, and we were looking for his grave, which is in present day Georgetown, Washington, DC. Myself, along with archeologists, I was coming from the historical context, looking at the theological context as well. We looked for his grave. We did not find it, unfortunately. Based off of the narrative, the historical record, it was an indication that he likely or potentially was gonna be buried in his backyard. We did not find it. We did an extensive a body of work. I also, while I was a graduation student, decided to say, why don't we assist in seeing and coming up with a funeral prayer in abstentia? This is well documented. You can look and Google, and you'll see extensive amounts of work on this. Lots of interviews from all over the Middle East and individuals from the Washington Post, et cetera. And we were looking for his grave again. We did not find it. But I think it's important because what we have in the case of someone like Yara Mahmoud arrives on a slave ship called the Elijah, comes into what we know modern day Washington, DC. And from various accounts, we know that on his deed, he signed in Arabic. Again, he's not an Arab. He's not from the Middle East. He is an African from West Africa. Arabic language was potentially his fourth, fifth, sixth language. So we have accounts in which we know that he would potentially, that he was swimming the Potomac River. We know that he would walk through the streets, smoking his pipe, and we also, tobacco pipe, and we also know that he would walk and chant in various devotional acts. So from accounts that we now have compiled is that he likely compiled and created beads, also known as tespi, of remembrance. These are some examples. I'm a collector, so I like, this happens to be from Senegal. This one right here happens to be from Nigeria. You can see the different colors, local, you, local uh, products used. This is a bright one from Nigeria with some red, gold, and green. I could go on, and I, I, I for, but for brevity, I think you get the point. And the last one, which is very important, which connects to a very important point, if we go back to the LDHI website, um, is this interesting context. Um, just go right back to the top, because I think there's an element I want to show. Um, for the LDHI, is um, the go to perfect, go to the conclusion part. Um, this right here happens to be a particular um, uh, beat, a remembrance assigned to particular um, spiritual order. You might have heard of Sufism. And many of you all might be familiar with Sufism, largely coming from Turkey, the whirling dervishes, which has become very popular in the American imagination. But I think it's important to look in the context of West Africa uh, that Sufism or spirituality also was very much rooted in the, lo the local. Um, and I think West African Sufism too as well from historical Sufi orders have a sense of looking for, I call them the devotional action or essentially over time Muslims um, I happened to grow up in Charleston and spent a lot of time in Catholic tradition. So it'd be very similar to Benedictine or Franciscan orders or the Pentecostal faith, um, just very loosely translated. But I think it's important to highlight this use of spirituality that was deeply ingrained in just these personalities. I think it's also very much, and I like uh, just as much as we look at the historical record, the question comes up often, where are and where were women. Unfortunately, the historical record that's been done so far on these autobiographies we have of Omar ibn Said, notations from others, um, the work I just re read recently, a wonderful work by, um, I think her name is Alia, um, uh, Dr. Alia uh, Hassan from the University of Michigan, who looks at the influence of enslaved Muslims in the Caribbean, and particularly um, in Trinidad and Tobago. But we have not notated or nor have we have been able to compile the work of women. I think it's only a matter of time. The next question that comes up often is where do these documents come from? Where we're able to compile the work of Said? Like the very difficult story of the enslaved person in the low, in the low country of South Carolina, but throughout the United States, 
these accounts have largely are these um, these manuscripts have come from family records and found in private home collections. My analytical historical investigative hunches that there are likely many more. So I think it's really important that we um, look and use investigative tools and techniques to look at what's out there, the preservation of knowledge and identity. And I think really important too as well on top of the different items that I've talked about with the opera, the item and contribution of working to look for the work of Yarrow Mahmoud and looking for his grave. The resource that you all have available to you as well is, um, is also how do we tell these stories that are important, not just in the context of uh, American history, but African history, but also global history. I don't think you have to pick and choose. I think they're all just as important. Sometimes in various settings, it's only emphasized as African history. How do we preserve this as being American history? Complicated, difficult, challenging. What do you see in these stories of resilience? And I use that term purposefully, resilience. Resilience is the idea, barring from engineering, that there's a shock, shock to the system, um, shock to based off of an earthquake. In the context of many of these personalities, Sali Bilali, Bilali Muhammad, the imagination that you can go and view, look at the works of Daughter of the Dust by Julie Dash, and a number of others, new works that are coming out via video and, and, and new technology and film, is that when you have individuals who were able to absorb shock, in this case, the Middle Passage, coming across from West Africa into the New World, stripped of identity and meaning and purpose, and then resilience is not going back to the status quo because there was no ability to go back to homeland, but in fact, find a new means of engagement. In this case, these individuals, just five that we've highlighted, are then able to move forward and offer um, a way of survival in the new world. And this is where we are all trying to understand where this is going forward in the future, the purpose and the meaning. So if you go to the bottom slide too as well, if you scroll up, we have, um, um, if you keep on going, we have two mosques that I actually highlighted. And I think these are really important. This mosque right here is the one where I learned actually in Charleston, South Carolina, growing up as a young man or young child, where I learned Arabic language and was able to learn very similar, probably ways of how the key individuals that we highlighted. But these individuals had literacy that I was able to learn certainly Arabic script, but also the localized effort of preservation of that knowledge. If we go keep on going up to as well, so I'm just going, going down, we have another mosque that's based in Savannah, Georgia. I'm working on an effort to as well, I'll give you the early version of it. Um, looks like the manuscript is going to be approved. Um, so we're working on it. I'm going to be editing it with another professor at Georgia State titled um, Recentering the Low Country. How do we look at the low country, particularly um, the low country of South Carolina and Georgia as a sense of sacred space in light of the large amounts of numbers of enslaved people coming through Charleston, Savannah, et cetera. I'm gonna stop there. I know I disrupted with losing the connection, but I think that might be helpful to set the stage, allow for some dialogue and um, there's a lot more that I could highlight, but I think that at any time, I'm always here as a resource uh, in terms of what this means. But I think that the last word I'll say to you um, in, 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 preserve, in preserving this context of what we've said too as well, is that these men and women in the context of West Africa and the journey to the new world were able to preserve identity. Before I forget, I wrote a book on this for my dissertation at Howard titled America's Other Muslims, um, looking at the role of identity and, and looking at resilience too as well that I think is really important. And one of the points I think that you all might find very relevant to this conversation is a chapter three called Africanizing Dixie, the enslaved African Muslim experience in the black American Islamic continuum. And I think that that's a really important thing too as well because the late scholar, Dr. Suleiman Yang at Howard University said there was a cutoff gap 
40 to 60 year gap between African Islam and African American Islam. The religion, the knowledge, the culture, the language. I won't even get onto the debates of the Jola Fours for the contemporary context. Um, but, but that knowledge consumption that was severed and then new movements, Islamic hybrid movements that fused black nationalism, spirituality, um, a hybrid nature of, of religion and politics. And that separation being the, the, those being separate, but also a continuum, continuum as well. I'll stop there. Perhaps that's a good segue to maybe open up for a conversation. Dr. Bond, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fraser, for that fine presentation. Um, so if you have questions, please, I have a few for Dr. Fraser in the interlude. But if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. If you'd like to speak them, please let us uh, know uh, that in the chat as well. To get us started, uh, the notion that you mentioned, Dr. Fraser, in terms of resilience, the ability to be able to absorb shock, I think is one that would certainly interest me as well as our audience. Uh, can you, uh, in terms of the, uh, you mentioned Sufism in West Africa and the other African uh, traditional forms of uh, religion, how do you see that absorbed in the African-American spiritual, spiritual tradition? We'll get started with that one. Thank Excellent you. question, Dr. Bond. The, you know, I think that the, um, and this is a Saturday morning, so you might hear a few nephews uh, noise in the background. <laughs> so, um, but I think that, you know, the, the this, this point is really interesting. The origin, I was recently watching Henry Louis Gates work on the black church. And he had a scene on the connection of the low country the origin of the black church origin also, though it might not be politically correct because I think we are wrestling through this meaning of binaries of what is black or white, what is Muslim and what's not Muslim, what is Christian and not Christian. The origin of the black church origin also is connecting to enslaved African Muslims. The early founders of some of the AME church's grandparents were from Muslim backgrounds. Some of the oldest black churches have family members who were a Muslim legacy. And so I think we have to really reflect and repackage how we view religion in the context in the new world and what that means. I also like to add a bit pop culture because I think it's important. In the 12 years of slave film, uh, you have the image of Lupita Nyong'o, who is um, being summoned back on Sunday, a day of rest on the plantation. And the wonderful Steve McQueen, who has a wonderful body of work on the Black British experience and his work on small acts, um, in particular on Amazon Prime. He talks about this idea of um, Nyong'o is being summoned and Chido Ijafor um, is stopping the slave master from the pig pen from uh, engaging with him and tussling, he's drunk, he's falling. And then McQueen captures this theme. He says, the protagonist slave master says, in the name of Allah, get your master to his feet. The, the, the music, the, the song, the dance in Charleston, South Carolina called the Charleston says in a, one, in one of the snippets, it says, and when you fall down, Put your hands to the sky and praise Allah. So whether one wants to overtly or covertly or privately or publicly engage in what this means in light of the, this, the, the, the context of a broader narrative of violence and extremism and terrorism and those, those meaning and what that goes, I won't get into that today. I think we've, we have to really step back and see how these threads particularly the enslaved African experience, which was much more expansive of how they saw religion. Allah, um, the wonderful book by uh, Dr. Arez um, on Omar ibn Said, he talks about this, this, this spirituality in, of Said and his opening line, him, his use of a protective verse in the Quran called 
Mok, the verse of the throne, that talks are, um, of this duality between this life and next, the dependency of both, recognizing both the earthly and the spiritual. And so to answer your question, because I could go on, uh, I think that this is an interesting concept that I think African-American communities, that the origin is deeply spiritual. And this is why I started off with African traditional religion and Islam. These things fuse, though individuals are sometimes wanting to preserve orthodoxy. I've said this on numerous occasions and I'm working on something on this. Every uh, orthodoxy origins are rooted in heresy. They're on the margins, but they also formulate orthodoxy. The origins of what we know, modern Christianity, movements and groups, same thing with Islam and Judaism, et cetera. So I'll stop there. <laughs> and yes, we do have a question that has come in on the chat if I have time to ask that. Uh, thank you for that uh, well-regarded answer there. Did you learn of any Muslim African slaves included in the 1838 Trail of Tears implemented by President Andrew Jackson. The Native American slaves were part of the removal program to Oklahoma. Not as familiar, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, think about the slave trade and movements, but we also have to remember there are other communities where we're certainly aware with enslaved African Muslims, but we also have smaller movement or we have, small, we have communities uh, from Syria and what we know modern day Lebanon um, some of the older communities too as well have pockets of Arab origins, Albanians as well. So the enslaved Africans, Muslims were not the only ones, but we know certainly likely there were, well, there, certainly there were others. We have um, a wonderful body of work just in the affluence of Punjabi um, Mexicans, what we know modern day would be in New Mexico, Texas area as well. So I haven't, um, uh, reverse engineer the work on which you're highlighting, but I wouldn't be surprised that there would be Muslims, smaller pockets, smaller numbers um, involved, but good question. Okay. Um, I don't see any additional questions coming through in the chat, but I do have one. I think uh, I know my students have asked me about it, Howard, and at least have mentioned. Uh, you mentioned early in your presentation about hearing about the legendary Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. And I think many of us have heard similar from our grandparents and others. Can you kind of share with us where these, uh, where this oral tradition certainly in America uh, has originated from? Sure, um, again, Timbuktu being one location out of many locations throughout the Sahel, right? This West African arid climate, um, the, um, there's a wonderful film called Timbuktu, by the way, too, as well, if you ever get a chance. Um, it's about five years old um, by the film director, I think, uh, Durahman Sissoko. Um, but, you know, there's the beautiful quote of West Africa, salt came from the north, gold came from the south, only the words of God came from Timbuktu. That the knowledge preserved there um, of not just uh, of, of technical theology, but spirituality, cosmology, astronomy, logic, um, debating points. This, this, and I think that, that this is important to highlight how we view um, locations in West Africa. As a student studying in West, I studied in Senegal, Mali, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia, including in Mali. Um, so obviously where Timbuktu would be and Jenne traveled there as a young college student. And for me, that was really interesting because I was, I was lucky to be able to travel with a, a, a professor from West Africa where we were studying Islamic thought, West African history, and side by side, I was also able to engage with these West African Islamic traditional teachers. So fusing a bit of the East and the West and learning of how they develop knowledge, how do they get to epistemology, how do they get to ways of being and knowledge? And so I think that um, to, to, your, your, to your question, I think students, we should think more, not just Timbuktu, but the broader region. Unfortunately, in 2012, and then es escalating in 2013, we saw the rise of fundamentalism and extremism in the region. And what we saw there also is the destruction of UNESCO World Heritage Sites 
at mosque at city uh, city Yahya and Jigambir. Um, beautiful locations the preservation of, of of manuscript written by hand I mean think about it the way of binding a text putting it together writing it down having an ink now we just have it quickly but one would treasure that one book they would memorize that one book and in many traditions uh, not the toxic ink pens that we have now but one would then use an ink that they then would consume because based off of the Islamic um, tradition, um, many of the traditions consuming those words of the divine would then be internalized in the body. So it is that fusion and that balance too as well. Thank you for that, Dr. Fraser. As we wrap up, <clears throat> I'd like to divert your attention to the chat where there's a resource folder for this particular workshop. Uh, and uh, we'd like to say thank you to Dr. Fraser. Uh, I particularly enjoyed your holding up the beads and sharing the books right behind you. Your resources are close by. Thank so you so you. much too as well. Again, my apologies for the technical hiccup, but we stuck to time. And I wanna thank Dr. Yugi, um, uh, Ms. Randolph and uh, Susan Douglas and rest of the Center for African Studies for always an incredible uh, effort and contribution. So kudos as always. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank I've been putting into the chat the links um, and made a compilation of the links and books that um, Professor Fraser uh, put in and they're all there for you in the resource folder. I've been putting them in chat, so you'll see the outer folder uh, with everything in it. Uh, also some links from Bridging Cultures um, Muslim Journeys bookshelf, um, which contain images from the Arabic writing of Omar bin Said and uh, Abdurrahman ibn Suri, and then an, a great image of Yaro Mahmoud. So those are all there for your use. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Frazier Rahim. Um, we're gonna take, a, since we have a few minutes, we're going to go back uh, to discover Africa in the Americas. There's a project that we've been working on, uh, which is uh, um, called Timbuktu to Timbuktu. Uh, and uh, if we look for that, there are actually three Timbuktu's that were 19th century towns located in the United States. So let's take the earliest one is in New Jersey. So if we can scroll down to find New Jersey, we will find, uh, yeah, uh, Timbuktu, New Jersey. Uh, Rutgers University has done a lot of work uh, on uh, Timbuktu, New Jersey, to, you know, working on the history and making sure people know about it. Uh, it was founded by free blacks and es escaped enslaved people. Uh, in the 1820s, and I think the first document that we know about a deed comes from late, uh, about in the 1830s. And we have had a couple of workshops where uh, one of the descendants, um, Guy Weston, from the early uh, residents of Timbuktu, lives in the Washington, D.C. area. So he has shared his experiences and his knowledge as he has learned about his family living in uh, Timbuktu, New Jersey, and they were among the early founders. Uh, we, if you, I've spent some time looking in uh, Chronicling America, which is a uh, which is a, a resource provided by the Library of Congress. I my, I was curious when did the word Timbuktu sort of enter the uh, the lexicon in the U.S. And uh, I haven't determined when that was. But I do know as early as 1819, there were articles about Timbuktu. And, we, and with this connection of people like Omar Ibn Said, who had actually studied in Timbuktu, and I'm sure talked about that, that whole knowledge about Timbuktu is percolating in the United States. And perhaps that is the reason that Timbuktu, New Jersey received the name Timbuktu. Uh, the other Timbuktu is uh, in New York. And it was founded by one of uh, an associate of John Brown. And uh, he, what he was trying to do, if you scroll down a little bit more, 
uh, Vanessa, uh, to the to the to the pictures, we can see. Yeah, click on uh, this was one of the early settlers, Lyman Epps, and then the next one will show Garrett Smith, who was a colleague of uh, John Brown, and what he was was trying to do was to give uh, free blacks and escaped slaves. Uh, the opportunity to vote. And one of the ways to do that was to, they had to own a certain amount of acreage of property. So he set aside this uh, land that he had in New York in the Adirondacks and distributed these land parcels. Uh, there's a lot of history we could talk about there. It, uh, Lyman was one of the more, if we go back to the previous slide, he was one of the more successful settlers and that he, he, he stayed there. And they did find that the land was too rocky to do much in terms of agriculture. They knew how to grow things, but they didn't, but the land did not support it. So I think he got ended up actually in doing a lumber business. And one of his descendants is a, a, a librarian um, uh, in, in, in New York. The third Timbuktu is in uh, California. And as we can see, it was established in 1855 during the California Gold Rush. Uh, it, it, and it was named Timbuktu because some of the miners, it was a black miner, according to the oral tradition, there was a black miner who was one of the early miners. And so they connected Timbuktu with, the, with this black man and named the area Timbuktu. So it's, uh, there's some of the images that we have uh, coin, what it looked like, and there's a marker with it. The place is no longer there, but uh, there's a marker there where the town existed. And I think there may be two, a couple of buildings that were there from the time of the, the, the in the uh, 19th century. So definitely um, early West African Muslims come into the United States knowledge about Timbuktu connected to what was happening in the in the US. I can shed a little bit of light on that, Brenda, if you'd like. Um, there <laughs> is a unit on uh, called um, Images of the Orient that I worked on for the National Center for History in the Schools. And it feeds into exactly what you're saying. There was a literally frenzy to find Timbuktu. There was the, National, the uh, Royal Geographic Society um, both in England and in France, they had a competition of who could reach Timbuktu and return to tell the tale. And this was in the, of course, it, it began in the, in the late 18th century, but it went into the 19th century. And finally, around 1830, someone won the prize by the name of René Caille, um, who, who was able to, you know, go into the desert. Many of them got ill, several died. And one of them, you know, sort of showed up in Morocco in tatters and rags and said, yes, I've been there. And he was able to, to prove it and then, and then presented and got, um, and got the prize from the um, Royal Geographic Society for that. Um, I can put that, the link to that uh, teaching unit. It's called a dramatic moment. And it, um, it lays out exactly when that happened. And there was, there was poetry written about it. They were expecting to find El Dorado because they knew of course that West African gold had been coming from this place. And the, the only information they had before these explorers from the West was from Leo Africanus, Hassan Wazan, um, which was you know, way back in the 16th century who had been captured on the Mediterranean um, by pirates and was given as a gift to the Pope where he then wrote the, the, um, the history of Africa. And that was the information until until Western explorers actually reached there. So it's not surprising that this became a household word in many ways. Yes. And I think if Vanessa could share, we're not gonna go into any depth about this, but since we have been talking so much about Timbuktu, we will share our new uh, website, which we have not formally rolled out, but we will shortly uh, called the Gold Road. You've heard of the Salt Road. Well, we have the Gold Road, which began of course in Mali and uh, this is how you enter. 
when uh, we will have a few instructions that we will put on, on here because as you see when you come in it's you see a lot a lot of images uh, we didn't want you to kind of enter an empty landscape but you can turn these images on and off and let's say we turned on th those three and we look for uh let's look for um places and we're going to look for timbuktu and if we hover over Timbuktu, you'll see it jumping. You see it jumping up there. There's the place for Timbuktu. If you click on it, we tried to put some secondary uh, resources in here that would be easier for students to read. We have some primary source material here. We have uh, images as well uh, from the present as well as the, the past. Uh, we want to make this very useful for your students. So we are looking for, we, we're probably going to set up some focus groups to kind of go through this site and uh, see how, any suggestions that you have. If you're interested in being a part of the focus group, please uh, email us and let us know. Anything else you want to add about it, Vanessa? Sorry, I don't know how to unmute myself when I'm sharing. <laughs> I think yeah. that is, that is a, that's all we could share for now. For no, that's a little teaser. So please go explore the site and give us your, 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 your feedback. Uh, I think uh, now that we will move on uh, to our uh, presenter, and I think Susan uh, Douglas or, um, oh, it's actually me. <laughs> I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Aya Khalil is an author and freelance journalist. Uh, she holds a master's degree in education with a focus in teaching English as a second language. She's taught at various grade levels, including pre-K, kindergarten, and college. Uh, she has been featured in Teen Vogue, Yahoo, Book Riot, and other publications. Her work has been published in the Huffington Post, the Christian Science Monitor, Toledo Area Parent, and many others. Her debut picture book, The Arabic Quilt, which is one of our 2021 winners. Kabul Winners this year was published in February 2020 by Tilbury House and illustrated by Anayi Samirjian and has won numerous awards. Her second picture book, The Night Before Arid, will be published in 2023 by Little Brown. Besides writing and teaching, Aya enjoys spending time with her family, traveling and cycling indoors and outdoors, she and her husband have three kids and live in Toledo, Ohio. May I present Aya Khalil. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Can everybody see the screen okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I immigrated to the United States from Egypt when I was one years old with my then two-year-old brother and my mom and dad. We lived in New Jersey, and this is just a picture here of me and my brother, Muhammad. Uh, I was about one or maybe two years old, two or three years old, and we were in front of the White House. And then this picture, the next picture is of me and my brother also. Ironically, we're wearing um, Christmas uh, sweaters and <laughs> we're sitting, posing in front of a Christmas tree. My apologies. Um, I have my notes on another computer. Okay, so this is also a picture of me right over here in 1996, 1997. I, we, we first started out in New Jersey and then we moved to North Dakota. Um, and this was fourth grade and I was there for third, fourth and fifth grade. My brother and I were the only Muslims in, in the whole school.
One day, my teacher asked me if I could write my classmate's name in Arabic. I was so happy. I felt proud, but there were a lot of names and I was still learning how to write. I was bilingual, so I was learning how to write both in English and in Arabic. So I went home that night and my mama, who's pictured right here with my own son, Muhammad, <laughs> me and uh, we both stayed up all night and we wrote everybody's names in Arabic and it took a while. We had to stand out the names and we wrote each name on a note card. The next day, I proudly handed out the note cards to each classmate. So each person got their own note card with their own name written on, Arab, with, on it with um, the Arabic language. Everyone loved it. They loved that it had so many dots and squiggly lines and loops. Um, it was fun for them to see and they all, got their own construction paper from the teacher and they decorated it. And I just remember <laughs> passing it out and people are like, wow, my name, this is how my name looks like in, uh, in Arabic and it looks really cool. Um, and it's nice because in Arabic, there's um, a lot of shapes too. So there's like lines and dots and squiggly lines. Um, and then they got to use glitter and bunch of art supplies, so it was very unique. So I think it was the next day, uh, maybe the day of, the teacher hung them all up in the classroom and they were all interlaced together, just like a quilt. So this is actually not the picture of it, um, but I did recreate this lesson a couple of years ago I was teaching at a Montessori classroom here locally in Toledo, Ohio, and I actually recreated this lesson. So you can, and I took a picture of it and you can kind of, I just did their first letter of their name because they are in preschool. So for example, um, like this, they're in the middle right here, there's uh, the letter Z for, I think, uh, Zachary. And then they got to decorate it. They used popsicle sticks and googly eyes and it was a fun lesson. They got to see their names in a different language. Fast forward to a couple of years later, we moved to a city called Lima and it's in Ohio. Uh, my brother and I went to Shawnee Elementary School for middle school. And we were two out of three Muslims in the entire middle school. And we were the only Arabs at the school. Um, and often I would lower my head. I did not wear hijab at the time. I was in sixth and seventh grade, but my mom was a visible Muslim and she would come pick me up from school. And sometimes I would, um, just feel uncomfortable and othered. Um, people would be like staring at her. And sometimes I would unfortunately put my head down, um, kind of squished down in the car. In middle school, a boy told me to go back to my country. Um, he thought it was a joke, but it was not funny, obviously. Um, I told my parents that day and my dad <laughs> gave me a lesson on how this is not any of our countries and this uh, land belonged to Native Americans. Uh, I still didn't feel that comfortable. I still felt othered, um, especially with all of the microaggressions um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Kids would ask me, oh, do you live in a pyramid? Cool, you're from Egypt. But no, I did not live in a pyramid. I live in Lima, Ohio. In social studies class one day, this was pre-9-11, a teacher made clearly Islamophobic remarks. Um, she made me feel uncomfortable. I just remember the feeling of me being in the classroom in there. And I was, everybody knew I was Muslim and obviously they knew I was Arab. Um, I had a different name. My name is Aya Khalil. Um, and I just remember feeling like ashamed and I just didn't feel like I belonged there. Um, and then I went home and I told my parents again, um, cause they were my safe, safe place. And my dad had had enough. This is a picture of my dad right here with my uh, daughter Halima. Um, <laughs> So he spoke to the principal 
and the principal invited him to come and talk to the classroom about about Islam and about Egypt and people thought it was really cool. Although at the time I was a teenager and I felt kind of embarrassed that my dad came into the classroom to talk about um, our heritage and our culture. But I still remember, I still remember that teacher's looks and she was forced to apologize. So she actually apologized um, in the classroom right there in front of my dad and in front of me. And she said that she made um, remarks that were I don't remember her exact words, but I, I remember her apologizing and uh, my dad being there. And so I just, I, and up until today, I just remembered, um, why didn't she like me? Why didn't she like my mom? I remember her specifically giving my mom um, dirty looks at pickup. And um, I just remember her her evil eyes and her her unfriendly eyes in her face. So we eventually left Lima, Ohio, and we moved to Toledo, which I'm in right now. Um, I went to an Islamic school here, and then I went to college. I went to the University of Toledo, and then I actually did my master's degree in South Carolina. So um, that was a great presentation to hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad, because I went to the College of Charleston. Um, but yeah, the microaggressions didn't stop. So even, even, of course, in South Carolina, I would, from my coworkers and from my, um, my colleagues, and even my, from my professors, people would say, wow, like your English is really good. Wow, your paper is so good. I mean, English is not even your first language. How is your English so good? Um, of course, I got questions like, aren't you hot in that thing? Um, people ask, so where are you from? And then I would say, well, I'm from Ohio. No, no, come on, like, where are you really from? <laughs> um, and then just, I, I just, people would just like randomly like stop me and ask like, hey, like, why do you wear that thing? Especially in South Carolina, because um, there were as many Muslims as there are in a lot of other towns and cities, but I was an adult, so I knew how to deal with it. Um, and also I taught in classrooms and it was, I, I taught, I've taught like in Pittsburgh and here in Ohio um, in South Carolina also, I worked at a school and I was just often disappointed by the lack of um, literature with main characters who looked like me. Um, growing up, I don't remember a sing, reading a single picture book or even um, a chapter book of characters who were Muslim or who were Arab. I think it was not until I was in high school that I started, since I, I did go to an Islamic school, so I do remember um, some books that I read that had Muslim characters in it. But before that, I do not remember seeing any books with characters that look like me. And so um, I have three kids and each time I have a kid and I try to find books for them, it was still so hard to find books with Arab characters and with Muslim characters, especially there, there are some that are um, self-published, but not out um, traditionally published. So you can't just go to maybe Barnes and Nobles and find them at the bookstore. And this picture right here, my book, The Arabic Quilt, it launched in 2020 during right before shutdown. So the first time I saw my book out at a Barnes and Noble was just actually um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I went to Barnes and Nobles and my daughter was able to take a picture of me <laughs> right next to my book. And that was uh, that was a really fun moment. Um, and next slide. So I had had enough. <laughs> I was just so tired of, again, not seeing um, children, a lot of ch children, just Arab children in general, there was barely, there was only like a couple that I could count on my two fingers <laughs> with Muslim characters, um, especially that were traditionally published, maybe just even, even fewer than that. So I sat and I wrote, I sat and I wrote a book. I was, I was working in the classrooms and even the classrooms that I was working in and the schools that I was working at, even if they, they were pretty diverse also, there were a couple of um, classrooms that were diverse, but still like it was, it was just the books were not there. 
so I sat and I wrote <laughs> the Arabic quilt. And um, it sounds easier than it, it really was, but I got so many rejections at the time. So I had to, of course, go back and revise. And I joined some local critique groups and revised some more. <laughs> And I finally found, I finally landed a wonderful agent um, who believed in me and my story and who believed in the Arabic quilt. And I almost gave up. So I'm really glad that I did not give up. Um, and eventually a publisher, which is called the Tilbury House, they acquired the book. I'm going to try to play this. It's a really short, I, I made a TikTok. It's my first and last TikTok that... I made. So I'm going to try to play that. But I did not give up. It was published. It won an award. It won a second award. And it won a third award. Never give up. So I worked really hard on the manuscript and I got so many rejections. But I did not give up. It was published. It won an award. It won a second award. And it won a third award. Never give up. So that was just a little TikTok that I made. And my kids helped me out with it. And it was really fun. So, and then um, I won um, the awards right here. And of course, I'm super, super honored about that. The Floyd's Pick Award. Uh, 2021 honor book for the young children for the Children's Africana Book Awards, and I'm super honored and grateful for that. And also a um, National Council of Teachers of English, a Charlotte Huck Award, a recommended book. And just some more good news. Recently, my book, uh, I announced the book deal. Um, Jessica Anderson at Little Brown, Ottaviano has acquired at auction. Um, which means that uh, several editors were interested in acquiring the book, World Rights to the Night Before Eid, a Muslim family story. Um, and it features three generations of Egyptian Americans bonding over holiday traditions and precious recipe in preparation for Eid al-Fitr. And it's supposed to come out in the winter of 2023. And this book was so wonderful to write because I wrote it during quarantine in 2020. Um, I was stuck at home and of course, like everybody else, I was feeling lonely. It was just uncertain times and I was stuck at home with my three little ones. And so what I do when I'm upset and when I'm lonely, um, when I'm just full of emotions, I write. So I was like, I need to write something. <laughs> so I wrote and I revised this um, picture book and it's about just baking with grandma and baking Eid cookies, which is called Kahk al Eid. Um, and just the grandma just sharing her own traditions and her own uh, culture from her memories from Egypt. And so it's just, it's, it's nice because again, it's so rare for me to find books on Ramadan and Eid uh, for my kids. Um, so, so I didn't, have that book, so I wrote it. So remember the teacher from third grade who asked me to write our students' names in Arabic? I hope you guys remember, but this is her. Um, I was able to reconnect with her, actually, when my book was published, and I sent her a copy of my book, and this is her at Florence Perkett School in Minot, North Dakota. And um, she came to one of my events recently on Zoom, and it was wonderful. So yeah, this book is it's based on true events growing up as an Egyptian American. And the same lesson, again, that I talked about earlier, the Arabic, the quilt. The, this is the teacher who asked me to write the students' names in Arabic, and she made me feel seen. She made me feel um, welcomed and comfortable, and it was just an inclusive classroom. Um, and then right next to it here is just a spread from, my, from the picture book, and I'll just read it out loud. Molly is not enthusiastic about the project. Who cares about Arabic? We live in America. My mom says we should only speak English. In response, Mrs. Hoggins starts 
writing words on the board. Algebra, coffee, lemon, sugar. Does anyone know what these words have in common? She asks. They come from Arabic words, Kenzie whispers. Mrs. Hagen nods. Learning other languages besides the one we grow up with helps make the world a friendlier place. We can speak non-English languages and still be American. So this is really relevant. I mean, we've heard like on the news over like several years, how people are afraid of Arabic and how people should, people have been stopping like people, just even, not even Arabic, just any, even Spanish or um, any other language and telling people to speak English, like you're in America. Um, so that's a really relevant. Um, but yeah, the teacher, see how it was so simple for the teacher to incorporate um, the Arabic language in her lesson and she really personalized it. So yeah, another picture of the teacher right here and she went inside the school actually and she um, she brought the book inside and she sent me more pictures. <laughs> so she made me an immigrant child. I was shy. Um, I was the only Arab, me and my brother were the only Arabs at school. We were the only Muslims at school. She made me feel empowered. She, um, she literally encouraged me to write my own story and I did. Um, and this was over 25 years ago. And this is also another spread in the book that I also wanted to share. That night as mama puts leftover shorbetats in Kenzie's lunchbox, Kenzie gently pats mama's back. Can you please pack me a turkey sandwich instead? Before bed, Kenzie writes a poem as she hugs her quilt, which smells like Tata's home. And this is also so relevant to kids um, and students. Um, I know when I was young, people would like kind of look at my lunches and be like, oh, what's that? Um, I know a lot of, I've talked to a lot of um, friends also over the years and how it's frustrating when they were young and they used to take like hummus sandwiches with them and like good, like hearty uh, like lunches with them to school and people would make fun of them. But now people, now hummus is, uh, is the cool thing. Now people have little packages of hummus and now it's a cool thing. But um, so a lot of us can kind of relate to this story about how our lunches were different or how kids made fun of our lunches. So she wants to fit in. But if she had a teacher who was um, inclusive, she, that teacher, well, she did, but she didn't know that at first. It was her classmates. But um, even like as educators, it's so important to just make students feel like their lunches aren't like othered, that their lunches are part of just regular lunch, right? So just um, how to make immigrants and Arabs and Muslims and BIPOC children feel seen and empowered. Just some of the things that I've found um, helpful over the years. So again, so important to have books and character, books with characters that look like them and not just sad books, happy stories and funny, funny stories. Try to find own voices books. So um, there are a couple of um, books out there that are maybe about like Ramadan or about Aid or even about immigrants, but a lot of them are not own voices. So they were not written by um, those people. So like by an immigrant or by a Muslim or by an Arab. So it's um, sometimes now there's the kind of a trend that publishers are, have been focusing on own voices books. Um, invite authors that look like them to speak in the classroom, even at a college level um or preschool level it just it's nice to have that um pronounce their names correctly and this is so simple but it still happens a lot and i'm going to read this thread right here right after i finish talk about their holidays and traditions and year year round not just a 10 or five minute lesson on ramadan don't make assumptions some kids don't want to talk about um their culture or their religion or just, so just just be mindful of that and not putting them on the spot and then this is also so simple, but <laughs> up until today, not I see people confused that not all Muslims are Arab and not all Arab are Muslims. So I've, I mean, even even up until like today or last week, I see people, even like in publications and in books, people will um, put books written by Arabs and they'll just put like uh, 
books that are not written by Arabs, but <laughs> they are Muslims. Mm -hmm. And it's so simple, but check ingredients if you have Muslim students in your, um, whether I know my own kids, my, my own daughter is really mindful about that. She'll, she's in second grade, but she'll check the ingredients. If the teacher or her classmates give her a treat or anything, she'll check it and see if it has gelatin. But I know when I was working in classrooms sometimes or at schools, like some kids would be shy or maybe they just, we wouldn't really come to their mind that they would check the ingredients to make sure that it doesn't have pork or gelatin. And I really like this thread by um, a New York Times best-selling author, Aisha Saeed. So she says, if you're going to be presenting uh, people to the public and are unsure, try Googling first. So she's saying to Google their names and um, make sure that you're saying their names correctly. Or like in, in other cases, also you can just ask them to send a voice note <laughs> um to them if you can't find it which is a great thing to do also um and then also ask everyone on the panel or in the classroom to share their name pronunciation and yes everyone whether in the class or on a panel because when you pause only to ask one you've implied otherness and it gets kind of awkward when when a teacher or a professor like i still remember the professors going through the name like the roster and then stopping like Okay, I'm going to butcher this name. Okay, before I butcher it, what is your name? So it's it implies otherness and it's um, awkward. So it just it's a good thing to just kind of go through and have everybody pronounce your name. And if you mispronounce it, it's okay, it happens, but don't joke about it. I mean, I've had, I remember people saying, oh, that's close enough. I've said your name close enough. It's fine. It's really not fine. Um, or they'll laugh, kind of make a joke about it. Oh, it's not. It's not Aya. Oh, like I uh, had a funny joke, something like that. But just move on. Apologize and move on. And don't center yourself and don't sit and say, oh, I feel horrible. Um, please forgive me. Just say, oh, I, I apologize and, and move on. And I'm sure a lot of people here also have had their names um, mispronounced. So how will your students remember you years from now? How will the marginalized students remember you? Um, will you help them write their own stories? Will you encourage them to write their own stories like my teacher did over 25 years ago? Um, how will you make them feel empowered in the classroom? Um, my teacher made me feel empowered. Will they remember the books they read in the classrooms with characters that look like them? Um, will they remember how you recognize their holidays and tradition? I know Ramadan is coming up. Um, students will be fasting and there, I know nowadays there might be standardized testing. So will there be accommodations for them? Um, will they remember that you said their names correctly or made jokes out of it or other them? Will they remember, um, they will remember because I remember. <laughs> I'm 33 years old and I remember third grade and I remember my third grade teacher, and I remember my middle school teacher, and I remember um, my racist teachers. So um, we remember. I'm sure you all remember um, your kind teachers and your not so kind teachers as well. And oh, okay, so I already talked about this book. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to go back to it because there are a lot of Mollies out there. And there are a lot of, this is a fictional character, but it's, we all, I'm sure most of us, I'll say most of us, um, know a Molly or two. <laughs> um, and some of these Mollies are teachers, unfortunately. But uh, this teacher here, she, her reaction was great because she didn't just ignore it. She didn't tell the, she didn't tell Molly, no, you're wrong but she kind of opened it up and she empowered and encouraged Kenzie to speak up and she did. Um, and then she continued to empower her and encourage her and she made the classroom in to an inclusive place. So again, remember when I talked about my own story and about how my teacher made um, encouraged me, she told me to write our, the students' names in Arabic, and, and I did. And so in this book here, she, the teacher made the classroom an inclusive place, again, just like my teacher. 
And then she, the the student Kenzie, she started to get more confident. She realized right there how her how strong her mother is, because right here in the spread, she says. As mama steps forward, Kenzie thinks how beautiful she looks. So she's not embarrassed anymore of her mom's accent. She's not embarrassed of her mom's clothes. Um, and she says, uh, mama says, shokran for welcoming me, welcoming me here. And shokran means thank you. And, and she realized right then and there that her mom is strong. Um, she realizes that her mom leaving her own country and her home and her family, that's being strong. She realizes that having an accent that is being strong. And then again, I just wanna emphasize how important it is these books are and books with um, main characters who look like your students. Um, these are just a couple of um, messages I've gotten over the past couple of months. <laughs> about my book, um, Salaam Alaikum, and it means peace be upon you. My six-year-old daughter is so obsessed with your book, The Arabic Quilt. I had to look up your name and know more about you. She felt so excited hearing all the Arabic words she already knows as part of schoolwork on Epic. Thank you so much. Keep up the amazing, amazing work. So um, the book is on Epic Reads, where um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but it's... Um, it's basically my book is up on on epic where it's a, a little like cartoon um uh, read the arabic quilt by aya writes and my baby keeps pointing to the hijabi mom saying that's mama just got my copy of the arabic quilt and my heart soared when kenzie's teacher encouraged her to share her language culture even and even created a class project. When I was an immigrant kid, I definitely had some wonderful teachers like that, and I would love to see more of that. Um, on the bottom left, kids can relate to text when you're deliberate in the text you choose. Kids in my class found the bilingual superstar main character in the Arabic quilt so relatable, and I can't wait to continue using books with characters of color doing everyday things. Today we read the Arabic quilt on Epic. So many kids were excited to share their culture after. On our break, a special friend spent time learning to write my name, love her excitement. As a child whose parents spoke a different language than my peers, the Arabic quilt by Aya resonates for me. How I would have loved my teachers to embrace my bilingual bicultural home and given me a way to share it with pride. Shukran. Sure, shukran in Arabic. Hi, I wanted to tell you how much I treasure your book, The Arabic Quilt. I used it at the beginning of this school year and had the most amazing experience in my classroom. I had a third grade distance learner. His family is from Egypt and he told me that there aren't books about Egypt for kids. I told him, yes, there are, I have one. I read it together and then I invited his mom to share with us her journey of coming to the United States. It was a beautiful and power, powerful experience. And then there's a couple of more. Um, I'll just go on to the next slide because of time, though. So um, Dr. Rudine Smith, uh, Sims Bishop, um, wrote mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And I really love these, um, just a couple of quotes on here that I pulled out. When children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are part of. Um, and then they, um, there's the statistics also from the Cooperative Children's Book Center, and it shows a percentage of children's books um, depicting main characters from diverse backgrounds lower than the number of books with main characters who are animals. So, and it shows the percentage. So 11.9 are Black, African, 1% um, are Native, and then Arabs are not even on this. So it's like less than 1% um, characters with Arab, with Arabs in it, unfortunately. And here are just some of my favorite books. Um, I'm gonna say that these are all books written by Muslims, except for Farah Rock's fifth grade, and that's written by an Arab, but she is not Muslim. Um, but it's also a great book, so I wanted to add that. Um, and then the rest are, I have just, if you guys want to take a picture of it, or I can um, add it to the resources in the end, um, just some Ramadan books right here. 
Um, I love this book also on the bottom right. It's called Your Name is a Song and it celebrates um, like names, basically what we talked about, like mispronunciation of the names. And the book also right on top of it in my mosque that's, that was recently released. Um, and it just shows the the diversity of uh, mosques and it's just it's a really beautiful book and I really highly encourage it and Ramadan mm -hmm. is coming up and I have a couple of um, great Ramadan books here also like the gift of Ramadan and Sadiq and their Ramadan gift also some more sources right here um, I do have a free educators guide on my website and that's in the google doc that um, Dr. Douglas posted that should be there. Um, and then there's also other sources, um, teachers, pay teachers. I know that there's a lesson plan also in there. Um, so if you just go to teachers, pay teachers and type in the Arabic quilt, it'll show up. Um, read alouds, again, it's on Epic Reads and Hoopla. Um, and then there's another, a couple of more sources on teachingbooks.net and also, um, A couple of other uh, sources I'm going to wrap up right now. Um, I'm the co-founder of Kidlit in Color. So if you want to follow that on Instagram and on Twitter, it's called Kidlit in Color. And we often just showcase, we're a group of um, authors who, um, who are own voices, uh, writers. So, and then we also feature other books also. Um, by authors of color. So we're, we're pretty active on Instagram and Twitter and we do a lot of book recommendations. Um, another great resource is we need diversebooks.com and Arab American National Museum. Uh, my information is written here on the bottom. Again, my website, I'm pretty active on social media. So I'm active on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So I'm always happy to just answer questions or just to engage with, um, especially with educators. Um, and on Instagram, there's so many wonderful sources. Um, if you search hashtags, just we would love your support. Um, like BIPOC authors, Arab authors, Muslim authors, Black authors, um, just supporting us by uh, like looking through our pages and checking out our books and buying our books. Um, it just means the world. Um, own voices, hashtag, we need diverse books and diversity reads. And that is all. I'm going to go ahead and um, mute my mic and hand it off to, I'm not sure who's doing Q&A. <laughs> I'm doing the Q&A. Thank you, Aya Khalil. Wait, sorry, I can't. Dr. Bond, you are on mute. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm making the same mistake as much Zoom as we've been doing, we would think we could remember to, to mute the mic. I'd like to say thank you for your wonderful story, for sharing that today, for sharing us your journey. Um, I was uh, struck by many of the, um, uh, not surprised by some of the comments made in schools. I grew up on a small farm in central Ohio, so I know about Lima and Toledo, Ohio a little bit. but. Uh, and I'm hoping and encouraging some of my pre-service teachers and others in the audience will please put their questions in the chat. I do have one to, to, to get started. Uh, thanking you so much for persisting there and getting your, your book published, how important it is. But what, uh, what really struck me, there's not a little girl like you in some teacher's classroom. Um, to able to sort of bring these issues to light and maybe uh, uh, confront them somewhat. Um, what might you say to pre-service teachers uh, coming into classrooms and though there may not be a little girl from Egypt in their classrooms, how they can incorporate your book and other uh, information uh, about um, uh, people from Egypt, Muslims, and, and Arabs uh, into the classroom. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I just think having just, just always like positive images and positive, just even like if you look at um, just like the history, um, finding like strong, 
Egyptian women to talk about, like highlight that, or like the scientists, um, Egyptian scientists in history, and just just highlighting that it's, it's just such a good thing because it just it normalizes that. And people, it's so frustrating because growing up, people would think like Egypt is like camels and pyramids. <laughs> it's not true. Like people would ask me, like, did you go to school on a camel? I'm like, no, like, what are you talking about? Like, that's the desert. Like, <laughs> I've only been to the pyramids, like maybe once or twice in my life um, over the summer. But yeah, just having that and showing like this true, uh, real, real Egypt, I would say not just sticking to <laughs> pyramids and camels. Um, we do have a, a question that's coming in through the chat. Uh, how did uh, the local writing group help you shape your book? Oh yeah, they were, they were super helpful. So at first I was getting so many rejections because I thought, like, I'm gonna be honest, like I thought writing picture books, like, come on, it's only like, well, what, like 32, 36 pages. Like, I'm, I mean, I have a background in journalism. Like I'm a writer, like <laughs> my degree was in communication and English but it was, that's not the case. It's so hard because you only have a, a couple of hundred words to write and um, it's, it's a saturated market. Like there's so many rejections out there. Um, so I got rejections and then I had to kind of step back and put my ego aside. And <laughs> um, so yeah, they were super helpful. Um, I will say that um, I still am in touch with them right now here and there, but it's helpful to have critique par partners who kind of have a similar background to you also because then they understand um, just things that maybe other partners might not. Um, so I've had, I've also, aside from my local critique group, um, I reached out to some Muslim authors and asked them to take a look just to see if there's anything problematic and to get their insight also. So super helpful to have um, different critique partners of different backgrounds. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> There is a question that's come in from one of my students, and uh, I think it's okay to call his name. It's in the chat. Aziz Austin is asking, uh, are your children facing similar problems in school as, as you faced? Yeah, that's such a wonderful question because I do like to talk about <laughs> my kids and their school because it's an, it's an incredible school and I love it. I'm just so grateful though, because when I was growing up, I mean, I immigrated when I was one, and my, my mom didn't speak English that well because she was still learning, she was an immigrant. And so she wasn't involved in school that much. She, it was just hard for her to communicate with the teachers. And my dad was was okay with English, but he was really busy um, with work. So it was mostly my mom. So she kind of didn't have, I guess, um, the resources and she just didn't know that like from her call from her being in Egypt like it wasn't a thing to go and like talk to the teachers if they did something um that was maybe not okay um but nowadays like you have communication communicating with teachers and the parents super important that's that was just not something that happened in Egypt a lot but yeah they're they've been amazing um librarian I'm, I don't know I don't think the librarian is here but she's always incredible she bought like she bought a copy of the Arabic quilt for every single <laughs> classroom um, but yeah the challenges that they faced I mean there are microaggressions of course um, that they have faced um, but I don't think they thankfully that they don't have the same challenges that I had their their school is diverse they go to a public school it's diverse um, so I'm, I'm super grateful for that. And our community in general is, is diverse and they have a growing um, Muslim population and Arab population. And our school has a, an equity and inclusion, a couple actually equity and inclusion uh, groups. So that's helpful also. Well, that's, that's really great to hear. Uh, I don't see another question in yet, but we still are inviting questions. So students, please feel free to ask. But I'd like to pick up on something you said just a, a little bit earlier mentioned uh, that you wanted your book to take children and adults' minds beyond the typical ideas around Egypt, pyramids and camels. What might you, advice might you give to teachers in order to, of course, and you, you had a wonderful list there. If you could expound on that, just going beyond pyramids and camels. Um. Yeah, again, I would, I, I really do like to focus on um, even like even focusing on like Egyptian athletes. I think that's there's a couple of wonderful Egyptian athletes out there, scientists, um, 
even even if you do, it's totally fine to do a lesson on pyramids and, and camels, <laughs> like geography and just like architectures and whatnot, but just not, just don't let it be the only thing I would say. I mean, even the, the quilt itself, there's, I mean, there's a picture of like the Nile River right there. So like, I mean, that can be a wonderful lesson. Um, that's a picture of a felucca. It's a little boat on the Nile. Like that's a wonderful lesson. There's so many lessons just from this picture, like even um, like on the quilt itself, like these, these flower, they're lotus flowers um, from ancient Egypt and they have a lot of symbolism to it. So there's a couple of um, lessons that you can learn just from this quilt and pages. But yeah, again, focus also on other things like um, even like writers, um, Egyptian writers and poets and um, like media, there's there's so much out there. Um, okay, um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, I do have an announcement to make for, uh, for Brenda Randolph, but I'd like to say thank you so much for sharing us your story and your, your wonderful book. We do appreciate that. And as you can see in the chat, we give much accolades there. Uh, the announcements, um, we are going to, if there are no more questions, we'll start the break and uh, we'll return at 12 o'clock noon. So we uh, don't, don't, please do come back. Don't, don't leave us. We've got a lot more great stories and books to come. Thank you so much, uh, Aye Khalil. Thank you so much. So we hope you're all returning now. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed your break. Got a few things done with your families and yourself. Um, it is my great pleasure right now to introduce my colleague, Dr. Rabia Khalil, who will do the next presentation. And um, her bio is as follows. Dr. Rabia Khalil has been an educator for over 15 years. She is currently an upper school English teacher at Roland Park Country School. She served as adjunct faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Education from 2008 through 2018, where she instructed graduate courses such as linguistics for teachers and teaching reading and writing in the content areas to ESL students. Dr. Khalil has presented at venues such as the National Council of Teachers of English, the National Coalition of Girls Schools, and the National Association of Independent Schools, People of Color Conference, NAISPOCC. Accordingly, she's facilitated workshops on topics such as Islamophobia, oral language development, African-American vernacular forms, refugee rights, prisoner rights, and empathy. Dr. Khalil earned a doctorate in educational leadership at Johns Hopkins University, a master's in linguistics at Georgetown University, and a bachelor's in English at the University of Maryland. She's currently seeking a master's in English at Middlebury College. She's a lifelong learner, obviously, who enjoys experiences that pique curiosity, catalyze the imagination, expand Shima, connect cultures, and elicit self-reflection. So Rabia, I am very glad to have you with us. And we're going to really switch gears to a, a book for adults. And I will um, hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I've really been enjoying this conference and I'm sure that you have been as well. Um, I'm so grateful to have been asked to present to you today. And I wanna let you know a little bit how my presentation is going to go. So I have pre-recorded several slides um, with audio content in them. I will be playing from those slides and then periodically I will stop the slides and speak. I'll also be integrating video um, and just some resources into the presentation that I hope you will enjoy. So as the slides are playing, know that I'm right here behind the slides. I'm going to share screen now, hold on. Remember to share audio.
Good morning, everyone. One. Welcome to my presentation titled Deconstructing the Colonial Gaze, Mas'ud Hayoun and Albert Camus in Conversation. My name is Dr. Rabia Khalil and I am an upper school English teacher at Roland Park Country School. I'm also a graduate student at Middlebury College Breadloaf School of English. You can feel free to reach me at any time at my email address Khalil R at rpcs.org regarding this presentation. It is my pleasure to be here at this annual conference hosted by Howard University School of Education and Georgetown University Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, asserting identity in children's and youth literature. The award-winning text that I selected for discussion is When We Were Arabs, A Jewish Family's Forgotten History by Masoud Hayoun. Masoud Hayoun is a journalist based in Los Angeles. He has reported for many news outlets, perhaps most notably Al Jazeera English. He speaks and works in five languages and he won a 2015 Epi Award. This bio in full as posted in the PowerPoint as well as the photograph are included in the hardback version of this book. I like to always tell my students the resources that are out there as far as access to a text. So even though I, I will be using these resources in class, I like for them to know about them as well. So for example, there is an audible version of When We Were Arabs that students can access at audible.com. And what's really wonderful about this version is that Hayoun reads it himself. So we are gonna take a listen to um, just some introductory words that Hayoun has to say. I also like to tell my students that there is a Kindle version available when there is. And digital text is wonderful, um, particularly for running searches. So if a student is looking up a word like um, Nile or Anwar Sadat or just whatever word or terms a student is looking up, it's easy to find it in the Kindle version. So if they haven't taken very good notes, um, haven't taken very good annotations or don't recall where something is in a text, they can just search the Kindle version. So now I'd like to play for you the audio version of the introduction. I am a Jewish Arab. For many, I am a curiosity or a detestable thing. Some say I don't exist, or if I did, I no longer do. I reject these ideas. My rejection demands that I paint for you a lost world to prove that we existed. Sadly, many of the faces, sounds, and moods of the last days of Shenu, of my grandparents' world, are totally gone. And only so much can be reconstructed here in writing without the help of the film and song with which my grandparents recalled to me our civilization and its decline. In the minds of many non-Jewish Arabs who remember us fondly, we are preserved in the cinema of a colonial era, the so-called golden age of Egyptian cinema that flourished from the 1940s to the 1960s. My grandparents' generation, portrayed in those old films, drips with poetry and grace. The films star Jewish Arab actors and singers, but aren't about Jewish Arabs. Rather, they recall a society in which we existed without question. We are a reminder of the cosmopolitanism, the pluralism, and the colonial degradation of that time. A time of fresh press suits and darbushes, of singing about our anguished feelings as we walk along the Nile. Whenever I play audio text in the classroom, I always ask students to close their books, close their laptops, put down the pencil, put away the paper, and just listen. There's something about that audio experience that can be quite focusing for students, especially students who are auditory learners and are somewhat distracted by uh, the written word when they're trying to really focus on the audio material. But after they've listened to the audio version, especially if you're only playing it one time, then have the students get access to a printout of what they just listened to. 
If they have the text, they can open up their books. Otherwise, as a teacher, you may have printed out a couple of copies of the passage. Put them in groups of four or five and have them just read through the passage together and pluck out any words that are interesting to them, that resonate with them, something they can connect with. So for example, as I was listening to this text, the word curiosity stuck out to me. So I might circle that and I'm, I, I might write in the margin, curiosity. What does it mean to be a curiosity? Is that referring to objectification or exotification or even marginalization? And I might write those words um, as little notes in my margin. Similarly, I might look down at that second to last line and see the word tarbushes. And maybe I don't know that word. So I might circle that and say, what is a tarbush, right? And maybe someone in the group would turn to me and say, oh, that's a red cap, sort of like the fez that you know we all know about, right? So after students have talked together in groups of four and five about this passage, written their notes, then bring the class back together in I'm stopping sharing for a second. I hope that you enjoyed listening to our author, Hayoun, really speak to us. Uh, I particularly enjoyed it myself. And as I said in the recording, I just love audio material in my classes. But now I wanna show for you um, the Oxford English Dictionary, which I always use all the time. It drives students crazy. But what I want them to understand is that they really should not be relying on Google for looking up vocabulary words. Um, so sometimes students think if they don't know the meaning of a word, they should just go straight to Google and Google will know um, what it means. But you no, know, I tried to remind them, uh, you really want to look up those terms on the Oxford English Dictionary. So I'm just pulling up the dictionary myself, hold on, and I'll give you an example of how, value it can, how valuable it can be, hold on. So here we have the Oxford English Dictionary. I've looked up the word pluralism and look at all of these myriad resources that you have at your fingertips with the Oxford English Dictionary. And yes, I'm selling you the Oxford English Dictionary. So first of all, sometimes students see words in print that they really can't pronounce. What's wonderful is that the Oxford English Dictionary shows us how to pronounce these words. Of course, they begin with the British pronunciation. Pluralism. Wasn't that beautiful? And then we see last the U.S. pronunciation. Pluralism. Pluralism. Right. So the students can listen to that a couple of times and then maybe feel confident actually saying the word. I noticed that an impediment to some of my students' vocabulary growth is that they don't know how to say the word. And going to YouTube and listening to a recording of the word may not really do the trick. So if you do not have access to the Oxford English Dictionary at your school, I recommend, especially those of you who are English teachers, get your school to get a membership uh, on this website. And I'm going to take you over to the definition that we're using here, right? The theory that the world is made, made up of more than one kind or substance or thing, one kind of substance or thing. And then it goes on into politics, a theory or system of devolution and autonomy for organizations and individuals in preference to monolithic state power, right? And then we can look on the side here, and this is what I, I really, I love it, I love it. We have derivatives. So we can actually click on pluralistic, for example. Pluralistic. Pluralistic. So Americans and Brits say it the same way, <laughs> right? So now they see that there's an adjectival form that they could use in their speech or in their writing. 
So I just wanted to take you there as, as a resource because when you're talking about material as dense as Masood Hayoun's text, you're going to need the armor of those resources uh, to command. And now I'll return you to the PowerPoint, hang on. Hayun, who was raised by his maternal grandparents, Oscar and Daida, frequently references the golden age of the Egyptian cinema. This is the cinema of the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, in which Egyptian stars really rose to prominence across the Arab world, and indeed across the world, wherever there were speakers of Arabic to consume and to enjoy these films. Hayoun says that watching these films with his grandparents really connected him with both his Arabness and his Jewishness. He emphasizes the beauty of Leila Morad, that she was indeed a favorite of his maternal grandmother, Daida. Now, I would have students take a look at some of the posters that feature Leila Morad and also Muhammad Abdel Wahab with whom she was frequently uh, in films where he would sing. He was also a, a composer and they were frequently in films together. I would have students take a look at these posters and share what's interesting about the posters to them. What do these posters reveal about um, this actor, this actress? And with just a simple Google search, you could look up more posters. A fun activity might be to print out these posters long form, just print them out in color and hang about three or four posters in the classroom and have students do a gallery walk of these posters where they can look at the posters up close and jot down some notes next to the posters and just walk around the room jotting notes down next to each poster and reading the notes that their classmates have jotted down can be a really fun activity to interact with these posters of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And there are many more. And Leila Morad was not the only Jewish starlet um, at this time. Uh, so there are more that you could look up and print out for students. Next, we'll have a quick listen to the National Arab Orchestra honoring Abdul Wahab with a recreation and a reinterpretation of one of his uh, songs. Whenever I am teaching my it's it's funny to cut myself off like, hey, hey no, I'm not ready to say that yet. <laughs> but now I'm going to play uh, some of the music as I promised. So hold on while I pull that up. quite finished playing it for you yet. I'm going to skip to a little farther along. Hang on. <laughs> Thank you. 
So we'll stop there. Very beautiful music. I'm returning you to the PowerPoint. Students about a place where they have never been. I like to take some time to listen to the music of that place. And Hayoon gives us a perfect excuse to do that. So now that my students and I have listened to the National Arab Orchestra, and I probably would have played for them the entire uh, composition, the whole six minutes of it, right? Now that we've listened to it, we'll talk about some of those instruments. Is there an instrument that's recognizable? Is there an instrument that you've heard before? And really give students time to make those connections. This is how you get them engaged in the topic, right? So they might say, I've seen an oud before, or I've seen a little drum like that. Is that a tarbuka? And then really give them a chance to talk about those instruments together. Just as So now I'm going to play um, a video clip. This one I haven't downloaded, so I hope it cooperates, but a video clip of um, the Darbuka being played. If you'll hold on one second while I share screen. So you can really see the extent um, of the energy uh, that those musicians are exerting um, as they're that as they're playing the instruments. And I think that um, to really get students invested, they have to see things um, like this. Uh, so hold on, I'm going to return you to the PowerPoint again. As Hayun celebrates Leila Morad and Muhammad Abdul Wahab, so too does he celebrate Um Kultum and Abdul Halim Hafez, both of who remain so famous throughout the Arab world, but particularly in Egypt. I'll play for you now a short excerpt from the text in which he tips his hat to, to Abdul Halim Hafez. This is on page seven of the text. It was through a bootlegger in Los Angeles that we found these films, and they were impressed on me when I was small. Oscar found the bootlegger, another Armenian Lebanese, not to be confused with our music vendor, through one of his Egyptian Jewish friends at our synagogue deep in the San Fernando Valley. The vendor rented out the blockbusters of the day and kept VHS tapes of old Egyptian movies recorded from an Arabic cable channel in a cabinet behind the cash register. My favorite of these bootleg films was the 1957 classic Lunette de Young, Girls These Days, in which the handsome so-called brown nightingale, Abdel Halim Hafiz, sings the song Ahwe, I Breathe You. I breathe you, the song goes, and I wish I could forget you. Fingers dance across the piano as the Western Orchestra crescendos to an Arabic tarab, a frenetic confluence of percussion, heart-rending strings, and a honey voice. The lyrics express this small corner of the human experience so acutely and with such beauty in a way that no other language but Arabic can convey. Yes, so again, hearing from our author Hayoun discuss Abdul Halim Hafez and to be equitable. I would share students, I would share with students also that we have wonderful articles out there about Um Kultum 
And I've looked up one that appeared in the Guardian not too long ago. And I wanna share that resource with you. Um, if you'll hold on, I'll pull it into the share screen in a moment. Just giving them so many resources to take a look at as they peruse the text because you never know what's going to resonate with students. So this article, She Exists Out of Time, Um Kulthum, Arab Music's Eternal Star. And it goes on talking about her, we see her beauty there. And it goes on to talk about her when she was born, how the Eastern world has uh, felt about her. And then there is no Western counterpart to Um Kulthum uh, is written here. There's a video of her music embedded into the article. Um, just a really great exploration of Um Kulthum. And I'm gonna share again, returning to my PowerPoint. I hope it's not um, too disjointed for you. I'm gonna play this um, whole slide. Hopefully uh, I'll catch it from the beginning. Before we again hear Hayoun's voice reading another excerpt from his text, I want to pause to say, when you are discussing with American students, the Arab world, Arab identity, Arab countries, it's very important to let them explore how they define the term Arab. And you could ask them to just go ahead and run a couple of searches. If they want to look at a Google search before they venture an answer, that's okay. If they want to look up the term Arab in the Oxford English Dictionary and read that definition, that's a good starting point. If they want to point at maps and say Arab means here in the world, that's okay too. But just let them find ways that they define Arab. And after they have given those definitions aloud in class, then it's up to you as the teacher to do some deconstruction there, maybe to do some repair work, and to also talk to students about one of my favorite concepts, conflation. What does it mean to conflate Arab with brown, or to conflate Arab with Arabic? right? And to sort of talk about what really does the term Arab mean? And then how does Hayoun define Arab? So now I'll play Hayoun giving us a bit more ground. And this is about a two minute play. So please take a listen. Like my ancestors for as long as my family can remember, I am Arab of Jewish faith. I am not Sephardi or Mizrahi. Those are two fairly recent but popular polite society terms for what I am. They are certainly better than slurs, but I won't settle for them. The term Sephardi, Hebrew for Spanish, describes Iberian Jews who fled during the Spanish Inquisition that began in 1492, when they were told to convert or leave. Many ended up scattered across North Africa and the Middle East where they were treated by authorities and their indigenous co-religionists as outsiders, in some quarters until my grandparents' generation. Sephardi has often been used as a catch-all term for all non-European Jews, a whitewashing of Jewish Arabs that ignores the well-documented fact that a great many of us have no known historical roots in Spain, and that even the Jews expelled from Spain to North Africa and the Middle East and the Inquisition had ancestral roots in North Africa. I have also frequently heard it used to describe not just Arab, but Persian, Desi, and other Asian and African Jews. Elsewhere, it is popular to refer to Jewish Arabs as Mizrahi, a Hebrew term for Eastern. This emerged in response to resounding criticism over the misuse of Sephardi to describe Jewish Arabs and other Jewish non-Europeans without any apparent roots in Spain. Much as it has the flavor of respect toward a community that Jewish Europeans have intermittently called a host of racial epithets, for example, Schwarza, a derogatory Yiddish term for people of color that literally means black, Mizrahi echoes the colonial European term Oriental. The term denotes people and things of the East as envisioned in colonial Western imaginations, the opposite of Occidental. I am not an Oriental, in English or in Hebrew. My family is not from East of somewhere, 
to us where we are from in North Africa is not in an imagined east of an imagined west. It is the center of our world. So we can really hear the strength of Hayoun's voice in that previous excerpt where he says, I am not Sephardi. I am not Mazrahi. Later in the text, he says, I am not Ashkenazi. I am not Zionist. What do these terms mean? It is important in the class that students deconstruct and explore these terms. And again, you can start with having them conduct a simple Google search. And that's what I've done that has produced this slide. So we see a map of Arabic speaking countries. We see pretty little Afro-Arab girls holding up the peace sign with their hands. We see the word Al-Arabiya. We see a boy on a bicycle in a war zone. Of course, we see a woman in Abaya and Niqab. We see camels walking the desert. And my favorite, my favorite, in the middle there, calories shouldn't count when it's Teta's food. Teta, of course, meaning grandma. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> As discerning readers and listeners, you have probably figured out by now that Hayun's text is a memoir. Accordingly, it is deeply personal to him. He does not say at all that he's being objective. Rather, he says, this text is a collection of my memories, of my interpretations, of my definitions for my culture, for myself, and of my family. Okay, so as we peruse the text, you want to keep in mind this is indeed a memoir. If you decide to use this text for your classrooms, if you are an English teacher, you may want to use it in excerpts to supplement another text, such as Albert Camus' The Stranger, which is often taught in the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program curriculum. If you are a history teacher, you may choose to use this text when you talk about the Spanish Inquisition, for example, which we heard a little bit about on the previous slide. You may want to use this text to provide fodder for conversation about the Palestinian question, for example. If you are a model United Nations coach, you may want to use this text to describe what Orientalism uh, has been in the past and remnants of Orientalism that we see today. I'm now going to play another excerpt from the text. And again, I caution you, this is opinionated and you may feel that he's really challenging some views that you have, but that's okay. In large part, I identify as Arab because reclaiming my place in a broader Arab world, an aspirational Arab world in solidarity with itself, scares our foes, who for so long have taught us to fight against ourselves. I am an Arab because that is the legacy I inherit from Dida and Oscar. It is how they remain, for me, immortal. My Arabness is cultural. It is African. My Arabness is Jewish. It is also retaliatory. I am Arab because it is what I and my parents have been told to be for generations to stop us from living in solidarity with other Arabs. Why would I claim Arabness in this way right now? Large swaths of North Africa and the Middle East have been devastated by war and dictatorship, and the majority of the countries that the Donald Trump White House sought to ban from entering the United States are Arab. In this context, to revive the Jewish Arab is to demand dignity for an Arab people continuously derided by the West's self-fulfilling prophecies for the East. America simultaneously funds dictatorship in and drops bombs over much of the Arab world only for Thomas Friedman and other non-Arab intellectuals empowered to tell our stories, to use our chronic struggles with governance and infrastructure to dehumanize us to a Western public. I choose Arabness because Arabness in reality is as diverse as the many characters in this book. There are dark and light-skinned Arabs, Arabs of many and no faiths, Arabs who further colonialism, and Arabs who stamp it out wherever they see it. I find the internationalism of Arabness enormously useful to reverse the tides of populism and neoliberalism, of which Arabs are made to bear the brunt. It is to choose solidarity over the division wrought by white colonialism. 
To quote the tomb of leftist Jewish Egyptian activist Shehada Harun, the father of Magda Harun, the current president of the few remnants of the Jewish community who remain in Cairo. Every human being has multiple identities. I am a human being. I am Egyptian where Egyptians are oppressed. I am black where blacks are oppressed. I am Jewish where Jews are oppressed. And I am Palestinian where Palestinians are oppressed. So we've already spoken a little bit about the importance of enriching any discussion in the classroom with as many relevant resources as possible to really make the landscape rich for students. I think it's imperative to also use newspaper articles that relate issues of the text to issues of the day. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about a news article that my father pointed me to. My father is a journalist and my mother is a lawyer. So anytime I visit my parents, we're going to sit down and we're going to have long discussions and sometimes arguments about what is in the news. <laughs> so he showed me this article published in the Jewish News of Northern California. And he said, Rabia, I know that you're using Masrud Hayoun. Uh, for your presentation, so you have to read the news about the changes in Egypt happening to the curriculum. And I just thought this was so exciting, as he knew I would. I'll just read a little bit from the article to you. Published March 11th, 2021, Egypt introduces Judaism into its school curriculum. Students in Egyptian public schools will be learning Torah verses and about Jewish culture thanks to a recent decision by the country's Ministry of Education. The ministry approved a new school subject known as Common Values, which is designed to show the similarities between the three major Abrahamic religions of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi is keen to teach the youth the values of respect for others, tolerance, and the rejection of fanaticism and extremism. And I'll stop reading there. So whatever our sentiments might be regarding al-Sisi and some of the controversial political decisions he's made in Egypt, we can certainly stop and reflect on how these curriculum changes might really benefit Egyptian children. You could also connect this article with the anti-racist agenda that we now have across the nation in our schools. How does this model in Egypt serve as anti-racist curriculum? You could talk to your students about this and see what kind of connections they can make. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for a moment. I have a few more slides, but I think that um, I would be infringing too deeply onto question and answer time. However, I do want to um, just quickly uh, take you to a website um, that I wanted to show you regarding that um, news article that we saw. And I'm going to share screens for a moment to take a look at that article and some really fun connections that you could make looking at newspapers, um, trying to get rid of the loading meeting controls there. Okay, so this is the Jewish News of Northern California. This is their website. And I said, hmm, I wonder uh, what's going on at the website. So we have that article, but then if we go to Bay Area News, for example, right? You can take a look at what's the conversation. They're investigating anti-Semitism, right? Honoring Holocaust victims. Thought this was fun here. Matza NFT digital art fetches four thousand two hundred dollars in a charity auction. Uh, I read this one to the end. But there are a lot of really interesting articles. And relatedly, I started looking up what are some other sources for looking at news in the Jewish community? And then relatedly, news in the Middle East. And of course, there's Al Jazeera, 
there's a monitor, there's other sources, but you should definitely familiarize uh, your students with these other news outlets so that they don't always feel like CNN and you know um, BBC, these are the only news outlets they can go to, Fox News, this is it, right? That would be a very barren landscape for us in discussing books like Hayun's. So you want to show them Al Jazeera, um, show them the Jewish um, newspaper in California, and there are plenty. That, that's just one example um, of, a, of a newspaper that, um, that my father and I found of interest. You also want to make sure that you're exploring these different aspects of Hayun's identity in, in as balanced a fashion as you can, um, which certainly uh, makes you have your work cut out for you uh, as a teacher. And I'll pause there. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Rivia Khalil, for that wonderful presentation. You received many accolades uh, in the chat area about your use and incorporation of various sources uh, in your presentation. So thank you very much. We do have a question coming in in regards to the model curriculum in Egypt, uh, wondering if any similar efforts uh, were being uh, facilitated in Israel, learning about Egypt uh, and uh, Arabic culture. So I don't know everything that's happening in Israel, but I certainly think that it has been an effort all over the world to try to more, learn more about one another as a global community. And in fact, I used to um, participate at my previous school in a program um, that is run by the Tony Blair Foundation, however we may feel about Tony Blair. Um, the Tony Blair Foundation has a, an organization, I think it's called Generation Global. And Generation Global connects classrooms around the world. And if you go to their website, you can see that they connect classrooms in the state of Israel with classrooms in Egypt. And the students in those separate classrooms talk to each other about a lot of issues, not just the Palestinian question, but what it feels like to be a teenager in 2020 or in 2021. Um, so I would say, even though we might not see curriculum changes as specific as the change that we're seeing in Egypt regarding um, you know, uh, Arab, Arabness and Jewishness and, and the fact that those identities can be intertwined. Um, we do see students all over the world now having great conversations on platforms like Generation Global that really foster international understanding among these students. And I bear witness to it. And my students at a previous school, we connected when we were reading VS Nepal we connected with a classroom in India. It was an all girls boarding school. And we talked about Nepal's politics. We talked about Nepal's beautiful literature. He um, is a Trinidadian author uh, of um, Brahmin uh, origin and bloodline. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's wonderful, thank you for that. Um, we have no other questions. There's a little bit of a discussion going. We did receive two new messages. Uh, they weren't questions, but I do have a question to, to lead off. I think we have time maybe for, for one more. Uh, your years teaching in the classroom is really spectacular. Uh, your students are so lucky to have someone like you. Uh, and you mentioned, um, uh, or at least uh, in some of the excerpts, that every human being has multiple identities. Uh, how do you expand the meaning of Arabs in your classroom? Or how do you tap into the identities of your, of your children in your classroom to, to bring that to life? Well, first I wanna say sometimes we're working at a school where we don't have any Arabs in the classroom, where we don't have any Muslims in the classroom, where we don't have anyone of African bloodline in the classroom. Sometimes we're just teaching white kids. Sometimes we're just teaching African-American kids and we don't have diversity in the classroom. And that's what I mean by using the term just. Right? that we don't have diversity in the classroom and we have to bring it in regardless of who our students are. So I think sometimes it's a mistake to say, um, because there are certain students in the class, you need to bring a curriculum that's relevant for them. I think we've moved past that. I think we have moved to the point that no matter what our student group looks like, we need to bring these world issues to the table, no matter who they are. 
So I think it begins with text selection. If in your school you don't have a lot of choice about the text that you have to select, then you can always be very um, careful, very mindful of the supplementary resources that you bring into the classroom. And that's one reason why I mentioned Albert Camus' The Stranger. I was asked to read, uh, to read that text with my students, to teach that text to my students in one of my first teaching assignments. And I really didn't like the book. Um, I found the absurdism absurd, frankly. Um, and all of the uh, philosophy and philosophizing in the text, all I gathered from that book was that the Arabs were denigrated. And I felt that. You know, and why would Camus do that? He was born in Algeria. Why would he other, you know, these people? So I was really grappling with the text myself and that's why I bring it up. Um, and the last couple of slides of my presentation, which I can, I can send to you as well. Um, and maybe we can put them in the document for everyone. But in the last couple of slides, I have some quotes from uh, the stranger sort of um, questioning, you know, who, who is the Arab, right? Um, and then I have um, Hayoun responding with questions of his own, of who is the Arab, right? So sometimes it's in this juxtaposition of texts that you can bring that conversation to your student, regardless, regardless of who they are, whether they're Arab or Muslim, or they even care about any of this, these issues, it's still imperative on you to bring it to them as the teacher. So if you are forced, like I was that year, to teach a text with which you're not very comfortable, bring in those other voices from um, authors who can provide a broader landscape for students. And then of course, bring in the music, bring in the pictures, bring in the camels, as we heard from our, our other speaker, Ms. Khalil, bring in the camels, bring in the desert, you know, and all of the stereotypes and put it in a big pile. And then you and your, your students have to sort that pile out. Did that answer the question? <laughs> you, indeed it did, even more so. Thank you, wonderful suggestions. Um, great, I don't see any other questions. Again, I'd like to thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed bringing in the music and the other arts and so did, and so did the uh, other participants as well. If there are no more questions at hand, I will uh, hand back over to our moderator. Thank you again, Dr. Ravid Khalil. <clears throat> um, I would like to echo Dr. Bonds. Thank you, uh, Dr. Halila, for this very rich and informative presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, now it is my great pleasure to introduce one of our own at Howard. Uh, Dr. Tricia Elam Walker is an award winning author, educator, and a recovered lawyer. Her first novel, Breathing Room, was published by Simon & Schuster Pocket Books in 2001. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, Essence, and other publications. She has provided commentary for NPR, CNN, the BBC, and more. Walker's short stories are included in the O. Henry Prize stories, new stories from the South, and other anthologies, and her essays are published in Father's Songs, Dream Me Home Safely, It's All About Love, and more. Several of her plays have been produced in her first children's book, Nana Akua Goes to School, our cover winner, was published by Random House in June 2020. In addition to the Children's Africana Book Award for 2021, Nana Okua Goes to School won the 2021 Ezra Jack Keats Writer Award. Uh, Dr. Walker is Assistant Professor of Creative Writing at Howard University and resides in Tacoma Park, Maryland with her husband. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here. I have learned so much this morning, so I'm really so thrilled. Um, thank you to the Center for African Studies for this opportunity. And of course, I'm so very honored to be um, a Children's Africana Book Award winner. Um, so before um, I read from the book, which is the main thing I'm going to do, I wanted to talk a little bit about how, a, a little bit about me, how I came to be a writer and how this book came to be. Um, so I grew up in Boston in the, in the early, uh, in the mid 1950s and 60s. 
Um, my mom was a children's librarian. She loved books. She especially loved children's books. She read them all the time. She read them that, like they were adult novels. She had a special chair she would sit in, of course, after she tended to us. And I remember sometimes we'd yell at her to get her attention because she'd be so immersed in the worlds created by the books that she couldn't hear us. <laughs> and we'd tell her that, you know, the house could burn down uh, with us in it because she'd be so busy reading. Um, but in any case, she also made sure that we learned to love reading. We didn't, we couldn't watch TV very often. Um, as a matter of fact, she would hide the TV and bring it out um, for special occasions. So we had to read. And at first I felt very deprived because um, I didn't know some of the things that were on TV that my friends knew. But then, you know, after a while, I got to, to really appreciate the richness of the worlds that were created by literature for me. And, and I wanted to do that. And I began writing little books when I was a child. Um, uh, the thing was though, that because there weren't really books with um, positive books with children that look like me, um, with characters that looked like me, the characters that I ended up writing about also did not look like me. So they had blonde hair and blue eyes. And I, rem I remember that my mother grew concerned about that. Like, you know, why are you, why are your characters looking like that? But, but she realized and understood the reason why was because I wasn't seeing that. So she really, it became a com incumbent upon her to do something about that, to do something about the dearth of, of children's literature um, that didn't have, you know, those positive images of, of children of color. Um, and it, it, that was a hard search for her. Um, but, you know, eventually things started to change slowly. I do remember how excited she was when Ezra Jack Keats' book, The Snowy Day, arrived, I think in 1962. You know, I was a little older, of course. And, um, and as a children's librarian and later as head of the Boston Public Schools Library programs, she made it her mission to make sure there were um, all kinds of books for everyone. Um, and, and she worked really hard at that. And, uh, you know, she also ultimately became an expert on racism in children's books. So for me, becoming a writer begins and is because of my mother really. Um, you know, my, both my parents were, were community activists, really made certain that we appreciated who we were, had the black art that they could find, make sure that the professionals who serviced us were of African descent. So they, they did their part as much as they could during those days um, to create that richness um, for us. And so, um, you know, even though I love to read and I love to write, I could not, I didn't see a path to becoming a writer at that time. And I became a lawyer because <laughs> my father was one of the first black judges in Boston. Um, my uncle was a lawyer. I knew lawyers, I understood that path. And I did that. And, um, and I, uh, I practiced law for about 16 years, but I was always kind of writing on the side. And, all, and, and it, at cer a certain point, I decided why not, why not do the thing that I really love instead of having this sort of bifurcated life. So I, so I did, and I went back to school and got an MFA in creative writing at the University of Maryland while I was practicing uh, law and, and raising my own children. Um, but I always wanted to, I wrote an adult novel that got published as was mentioned in the introduction, but I always wanted to um, write for children. And um, it just was something in the back of my head. I have a cousin who's an illustrator and she, uh, her name is Aqua Holmes. I'll go ahead and, and give her a shout out. Um, she's won a lot of awards for her illustrations. And she and I actually grew up together. So we had some of the same experiences of creating art. Um, our childhood, we didn't have computers, any of that. We were, we were always creating. And we even would um, sort of take our show on the road, my brother as well. Um, and we would go, my mother would take us to nursing homes where we'd recite our poems and do our little plays and read our stories. So it was a very rich um, environment. Um, language was really important to us. We were always praised for whatever we did, no matter how crazy it may have looked or seemed. And, it, and all of that paid off because I said, uh, my cousin became an illustrator, uh, I became a lawyer and a writer. Uh, one of my brothers became a renowned rapper, one of the first rappers to fuse jazz with his music. My sister became a bilingual educator. My other brother became a, um, a theater director, uh, went on to become, to head the theater department at Stanford and then become the vice provost there. 
and is now the president of Occidental College. So all that immersion in literature at an early age really you know, meant something and paid off for all of us. But back to um, wanting to write this children's book. Uh, so you know, my cousin and I would talk about, you know, why don't we do something together? Why don't we, wouldn't that be great since we, you know, since we had this childhood together? Um, and so uh, we, you know, we would we, we talk about this. As I said, she was already illustrating, winning awards, et cetera. But at one point she said to me, you know, I have these collages. Why don't you look at them and see if, you know, see if you see a story in here. And it was a really good exercise for me because I'm pretty used to creating the stories, <laughs> being the story creator. But I looked at her work and really tried to find the story in it because of course, in all art, there is a story, there is a narrative. And so, you know, I took my time and looked at all the different collages because at first they didn't seem like they were cohesive because they were done at different times about different things. Um, but then I began to see the story in it. And it ultimately, it became a book called Dream Street which is coming out in the fall. Um, and what I did was I sort of made little vignettes of all the collages and figured out what the stories were in each collage and, and who lived on Dream Street, who these purple, who these people were in these collages. Um, and so, but that was, so that was the book we took out into the world to sell, gave to the agent to try to sell. Um, and, and at first we got a lot of rejection saying it wasn't a children's book, it wasn't a picture book. Maybe it was a coffee table book, something like that. But ultimately, um, and we tried to adjust it, but we, but we kept, we pursued it. So, so don't give up. If something gets rejected, don't give up. Um, ultimately, the agent found someone who loved it at Random House and wanted to do it. Um, the problem was that because my cousin had so many other projects and they don't like children's books to compete with one another, um, they kind of put it on the back burner. But the wonderful thing about that was they gave me a separate contract to do another book. So this was completely, you know, uh, amazing to me because it wasn't even anything I dreamed of. Um, but it also was a little bit of pressure because then I had to come up with a story from my, on my own. Um, and so I just kept thinking about it. I happen to be a Buddhist. And so I began chanting about it. Like, what, what, what can I write about? What, what story do I want to tell? And I send some ideas to my agent and she'd say, she did not mince words, she'd say, that's boring, or that's been done before, or that's depressing. And the deadline was, was come, closing in upon me. Um, but ultimately, I was at a friend's house chanting, and, that, and where I was had some African masks on the wall um, in front, uh, beside the altar, similar to the mask that's behind me. Um, and I really feel like as I was chanting, this sounds a little hokey, the story kind of came to me through those masks. Um, and I started thinking about a little girl who was different. And at first I thought it would be the little girl who would have the um, tribal markings on her face. But, but later I started doing research about it and realized it would probably be someone of an older generation. So I ended up making it her grandmother. But I really wanted to write a story about difference, about cultural difference, about identity, um, about celebrating all of that. How do you do that? How does a child do that? How does a child learn about that? Um, and so, you know, the story ultimately became this story of a little girl who loves her grandmother dearly, her grandmother's from Ghana, also wanting to, you know, represent the immigrant experience. Um, and she wants to protect her. She doesn't want anyone to laugh at her or make fun of her, um, knowing that, you know, her grandmother looks different. And, and so that was, that was the, you know, that was the beginning of Nana Akua Goes to School which I am now gonna go ahead and read to you. Um, one of the things I wanna say about it, though, I was really struck by Aya's beautiful book and about how we both you know, incorporate the quilt to help tell the story of difference. So I think you'll see that um, in this book. And I know Dr. Um, Ayuji is gonna help me with this. Great, thank you so much. So this is Nana Akua Goes to School. It's circle time, Zora's favorite time of the day. She scoots to a spot next to Theodore and crisscrosses her legs on the rainbow shaped rug. Ready, set, Mr. Dawson says, looking at the children over his glasses. You bet, they respond and quiet right down. Next Monday is a very important day, Mr. Dawson continues. Each of you will bring your grandparents to school so they can share what makes them special. Next page. Can they see the next page? Okay. 
Yay, Grandparents Day, shouts Alejo without raising his hand. My abuelo is the best fisherman in the world, and he can explain how to catch the biggest fish. Bisu thrusts both hands up and says, my Mimi is the best dentist in the world. She can bring everyone a toothbrush. All the children chime in, their voices leaping over each other to tell what's best about their grandparents. Inside voices, please, says Mr. Dawson. What do yours do, Theodore whispers to Zora, but Zora just shrugs. Next page. Please, Dr. Yuji. Oh, maybe she can't hear me. Can you uh, move it to the next page, please? Sorry, so I, I'm changing the page, but somehow it might not be showing up. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, I'll just keep going. <laughs> okay. Hopefully everyone can listen. Um, and then I can try to hold it up too. Let's see. Maybe I should. Maybe I just, I, I won't uh, make it, uh, enlarge it. Maybe that's what's causing the problem. Oh, maybe so. You see, you, do you, is this the correct page? Uh, I don't see a page yet. <laughs> that is strange. Okay, let me try again. Okay. Okay, is this the correct page? It just says it started screen sharing, but doesn't show anything. I don't know if anyone else can see it, but I can't. Vanessa, give it just a moment to see if it loads. Okay. okay. Still not loading. No, that's very okay. Very no worries. I will. I will show the page. I'll just try to show it as best as I can. Hopefully, people can see this. Okay, when Zora's papa brings her home from school, Nana Akua, her favorite person in the whole universe, is peeling potatoes for dinner. Although Nana's feet don't even reach the floor. She seems as tall as the giant playground slide. Maybe that's because she's filled to the brim with stories about growing up in West Africa, where people carve statues out of wood, trees drip with mangoes, and crayon colored outdoor markets sell everything you can imagine. And there's Nana Kua. Nana puts down the peeler and gives Zora one of her big hugs, the kind that wrap around you like a sweater. Grandparents' day is next week, she says. Maybe you can help me decide what to talk about. Zora stares down at the floor. Zora's mommy knows about Grandparents' day too. Her smile is bright as a sunbeam. How about if Papa plays the djembe drums while Nana talks to your classmates, she suggests coming over to help Nana. I wanna make sure you see the illustrations because the illustrator for this book was April Harrison, who was amazing. Zora frowns and thinks about the last time she and Nana went to the park. Nana pushed her high to the sky on the swings and Zora was almost flying. But on their way home, a little boy pointed at Nana and Zora heard him say to his mother, that lady looks scary. And the very next day, a server in the little tea house stared so hard at Nana, she forgot to bring them sugar cookies with their tea. This is because Nana Akua looks different. When she was young, her parents followed an old African tradition. They put marks on her face to show which tribal family she belongs to and to represent beauty and confidence. Those marks never wash off and never go away. Zora looks at her Nana, holding back tears that wait in the corners of her eyes. Nana Akua puts down her potato, takes Zora's hand and says, my precious girl, why such a sad face? It feels hard to explain, but Zora wants to try. She swallows and takes a deep breath. <sighs> what if someone at school laughs at you or acts mean, she asks quietly. Nana Akua thinks for a moment. 
I have an idea, she says, and puts Zora's arm through hers. Together, they walk down the hall to Zora's room. Nana points to the bed. How about we bring your favorite quilt to class? These quilt patterns come from another long ago tradition. Even though they're not exactly the same as the marks on my face, they can help explain them. What do you think? Zora traces some of the designs she loves with her fingers. When Nana Akua first made the quilt for Zora, she explained that the patterns were Dinkra symbols of the Akan people of Ghana. The symbols represent more than 50 important qualities like wisdom and creativity. Zora wishes the marks were only on the quilt and not on Nana Akua's face. Still, she says, okay, we can bring it. On Grandparents' Day, Zora wears one of her African dresses sewn by Nana. And Nana Akua looks especially regal in her bright patterned kaba with matching skirt and head wrap. There are lots of oohs and ahs when they arrive. The classroom is decorated with a rainbow balloons that float up to the ceiling. There are large welcome signs made with colored markers. A tall chair is on the rug for the grandparents to sit in when they speak. First is Alejo's abuelo, who passes around photos of the biggest bluefish he ever caught. Next, Bisu's Mimi shows a class a video called Mr. Cavity and the Magic Toothbrush. And then Lester's grandparents, who owned a barber shop for many years, hold up matching clippers. Anybody need a haircut, they ask, laughing. Finally, it's Nana Akua's turn. She sits in the special grandparent chair with Zora next to her. Zora clutches her quilt tightly and her voice shakes when she gives her introduction. This is my Nana Akua and she is from Ghana, a country in West Africa. Nana Akua squeezes Zora's shoulder and starts talking. Hello, children. I'm sure you noticed the marks on my face. Has anyone seen anything like them before? No, say all the children. These marks were gifts from my parents who are happy and proud that I was born. She continues, I am likewise proud to wear them. Most Ghanaian parents don't celebrate in this way anymore, but it was once an important tradition. Zora watches her eyes wide as cups as Nana Akua walks slowly around the circle so everyone can see her face up close. It's interesting, she says, that in this country, I often notice people who put tattoos on their body that have special meanings. Yours are way better than tattoos, Theodore says because they grew up with you. Nana Akua smiles. Why, thank you, young man, she says. And I brought some special makeup so each of you can have beautiful African symbols on your faces too, the kind that wash off. My expert helper will hold up her quilt, which shows some of the symbols you can choose from. I hope you can see this illustration that shows the markings. I just love this one. The other students look at Zora expectantly. She unfolds the quilt with care. Today, I'm going to choose the Bessie Saka symbol. It looks like a flower. And my Nana told me it stands for power and unity. And April, the illustrator, put some of these Odinkra symbols, hid some of them other places in the book, but you can see one, the Bessie Saka symbol right there in Zora's hair. Nana Akua paints the symbol into Zora's cheek in gold while Zora holds very still. The other children clap when it's all done. Come and choose your favorite symbol, Zora says to them.
Alejo, who wants to be a beatboxer, points to the Shebwe Muda symbol because he thinks it looks like a keyboard. Nana Akua tells him it means high quality and excellence. Bisu wants to be a veterinarian and picks the Denshem symbol, which is shaped like a crocodile, one of her favorite animals. It stands for cleverness. Peter and Inez decide on the Adwell symbol, which looks like the inside of a sliced apple with two identical halves. Twins like us, Peter says. Nana says the symbol means peace and quiet. Like mommy and daddy say we never give them, Inez shouts. Nana Akua paints and paints until every child has their own design. The other grandparents choose symbols for themselves too. You can see the symbols on everybody's cheek. Zora's face glows as she watches Nana Akua fold up the quilt to go home. And this time it's Zora who gives her very special, not like anyone else's Nana, one of those big hugs, the kind that wrap around you like a sweater. Thank you. Um, I wanna show you the end papers of this book, which are also wonderfully drawn by April Harrison, um, because it shows some of the many Adinkra symbols, not all of them, of course, we had to, we had to narrow it down. But I found that, um, Children and teachers really love this because children can choose their symbols and recreate them and learn what the meanings are. And um, one of the symbols, this, the Wawa Aba, was used throughout the Black Panther. So that seems to be a very popular one. Um, but we, we really had a great time creating this. And how, I really love how everything came together and how fortunate I was, as I said, to have such um, a wonderful illustrator. So I guess I will stop there and see if there are any questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Tricia Alem, for that wonderful book and your wonderful story uh, that went along with it. It was really, really amazing. Love the visuals in the background as well. Checking the chat here, I'd like for you uh, for the audience to please uh, chat your questions. If you'd like to speak your questions, we'd love to hear your voice. So we're not, uh, don't wanna silence you in any way, right. but until, um, until questions come, I certainly have some, many actually. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to say thank you for reading the book. It really added the sense of, uh, you realize you never get too old to enjoy listening to, to literature, especially read. My mother believed. <laughs> read by such an esteemed author or any author as yourself. That was just wonderful. Um, how have you, okay, so we do have a question and I wanna give it to our audience here. How have you shared your book during COVID? You know, everything's been virtual, of course. And um, as all of us are finding out with COVID, there are some good aspects to it. So it's been nice not to have to leave my house and find a parking space or fly anywhere. Although, of course, I miss that as well. Um, I, you know, I can just sit here and I've, I've gone to classrooms that maybe I wouldn't have been able to get to. I was recently in this amazing um, private school in California um, where the kids were back face to face and they had all this plexiglass and they had markings on the floor for the six feet. I was really amazed at, at how they were handling this. And they were so smart and they had wonderful questions. So um, I've been able to, to do a lot, a lot of virtual classrooms, a lot of um, radio shows, et cetera, um, and talking back and forth to other authors. So it's been pretty cool. <laughs> well, thank you. I do wanna give regards to a remark that just came in in case that, that uh, person would like to speak. She says her daughter has a tribal mark uh, and is now living in Canada. This story will be very uh, liberating to her. Uh, question did come in. Uh, do the reference that, by the way. That, absolutely. Do the reference pages at the end of the book include the, the proverbs? They, well, they include, they tell what each symbol means, if that's, if that's what you're asking. So 
So for instance, it will say the name of the symbol, like I'll show you, um, the heart symbol is the acoma. It shows you how to pronounce it. It says it is a heart that means love and patience. So each of them show the pronunciation and what the symbol means, yes. Very good. Uh, another question. Um, in Ghana, there are a Jinka everywhere. Have you drawn on those images? Uh, well, yes. I mean, that's what the Adinkro symbols are. And also one of the things I found is that, you know, I mean, I understand that back in the day, they were only worn by royalty and often just for funerals and that kind of thing. But but those Adinkro symbols have certainly evolved because they're all over the place in this country on T-shirts, on jewelry. And I was in New Orleans one summer and saw that they were in the filigree of a lot of the houses. It's really quite astonishing. And then I, my daughter's in Seattle right now for a couple of months, and she was showing me that they're in some of the sidewalks. There oh, are really? different symbols to the side. Yes. So it's very, you know, I, they could be everywhere. I'm, I'm amazed. So, Absolutely. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't see another question yet. There is a great comment in there. But I wanted to ask as a follow up to that, you mentioned that the Adinkra symbols were used by the Black Panthers during the civil rights movement. Was that intentional? No, or I'm, that... Uh, the Black Panther, I meant the Black Panther movie. So oh, I, movie. I have okay. no idea if the Black Panther, <laughs> they, they could have for all that I know, because as we know, they knew a lot and they researched a lot. But the Wawa Abba symbol, which is this, was used throughout the Black Panther movie. And that's okay, what I was, I, that's what I was alluding to. So in a lot of the costumes, you'll see this as part of a belt or somewhere else. But have, the next time you look at that movie, look for that wow wow the symbol. <laughs> oh wow, that fantastic! I'm just checking the chat here. Uh, have you been able to get your book to Ghana? No, can you help me? <laughs> I would love to. If anyone knows a way to do that, I would love to. When oh. things open up, that's one of the first places I do want to go, though. And I will certainly take a bunch of books. And if I can get into some classrooms, I would love to do that. That would be great. So anyone has any ideas, let me know. <laughs> great. Let's see. Um, I'm wondering about whether we would be able to connect those tribal markings uh, with tattoos and other ways of body markings or marking the body celebrating the body um i don't see why not i mean that was one of the, the connections i was trying to make to for children to understand you know to think about the fact that yes people they know people with tattoos i'm sure um and so that was that was the idea that and then the little boy theater was like yeah but yours grew up with you so i was really trying to make it a fun thing and the kids would be excited about because i think that's what happens when we really talk to kids honestly about difference cultural difference, mm -hmm. things that they may not know about. They think it's cool. You know, a lot of times we're worried, but not to worry. <laughs> That's right. We're worried and the, the kids uh, think it's absolutely cool. Just a comment about welcoming you to uh, a particular uh, library. Um, Can I jump in here, Helen? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so I see that Kathy Knowles um, has, has made that comment. She said, you'd be welcome at our libraries. And uh, Kathy knows is one of our Kaba winners, and uh, she has built uh, eight with uh, uh, like eight libraries uh, in Accra. I've had a chance to visit a few of her libraries, and you know you can see a Dinkra symbols, and that would be that would be wonderful if we could get you to yes yes yes. <laughs> I don't know if Kathy wants to come onto the screen and talk a little bit about, you know, her work and, and, and I, you know, the, we, we, we watched the students doing wonderful drawings and I think her symbols are just, just everywhere. And yes, that would be a wonderful connection, you know, with, with the libraries in addition, you know, to Kathy's and, and others. Oh, that's amazing. I would love it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Brenda. I enjoyed your story. Um, in fact, I'm going to Ghana next month and I would love to take copies of your books. I don't know if they're available here in Canada or not, but I during know, my but time, I visit from library to library and that would be really thrilling for me. Let's make sure we get each other's info so we can make that happen. I would okay. love that. Thank you so much. You're most welcome, Tricia. Wonderful connection making there. Are there others that would like to come on and speak? hear your voice or turn your camera on. We'd love to, we'd love to hear your voice. Um, I do have a question. Uh, we have just a few more minutes. Uh, going back to making the connection with your book and body markings. Uh, 
Is your book one of the first that really calls attention to the markings, the traditional African markings that sometimes people put on their face? I don't remember seeing many books that really focus on that. I, I know there are other adult books and um, informational books. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen children's books, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. So right. I don't know if anyone knows them any, I would love to know. Yeah. Good. That was, that was one thing that I um, uh, caught my eye there. Um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, there haven't been many that, 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 that I have seen, um, but uh, we have a, a new book, which is one of our Akaba winners. And I believe that there may be a markings uh, in this book mm -hmm. um, uh, on the uh, uh, idea of the Benin kingdom. Oh. I think that's a, that would be a great connection with your with your book, Tricia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I will look for that. Uh, another remark, uh, and I thought I'd have a uh, someone has made a great comment. If I can, if they'd like to speak further on it, I'd we'd love to hear their voice. But this is relevant not only for Ghana but other West African countries. Uh, we also have these marks. Colonialism also affected us adversely. Yeah, so absolutely. Wider, you know, application uh, to, to the markings. Uh, one thing that really caught my attention, and I'd like to know a little bit about your writing process uh, mm -hmm. as I was listening to it, and I'd love to hear how others connected to this. But you started the book with this, this description and you ended it. Uh, a hug that wraps around you like a sweater. That was that immediately connected with me, that, that imagery. I'd like to know a little bit about how you come up with that, the process on that wonderful descriptive, and if others thought so too as well. I, I wish I had a really <laughs> astute way to explain that to you. Um, it just, you know, that's what I, I think what I do when I'm writing, I know that I want my audience to be able to picture what I'm feeling or seeing. So I'm always trying to think of how can I describe it so someone can see it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was just the image that came to me. And I wanted to repeat it because I want, I thought this will be good for children. Children know what, you know, how a sweater wraps around them and they know what a wonderful hug feels like. And especially during this time of COVID, I've had people say to me that that was really meaningful to them because people haven't been able to hug. I mean, it's getting better now as we know, but, um, but yeah, I, that, that was the picture and the image I saw and I just wanted to recreate that. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Yes, I, it, it was just something that I connected with. I Let me go to the chat here. I certainly don't want to miss. Um, yes, we uh, from one of our speakers, Dr. Rabia Khalil, uh, certainly involves a large conversation about aesthetics and beauty standards. Yes. Can you maybe expound a little bit on that? And I want to do a shout out to Dr. Rabia Khalil for adding that in. And if she'd like to speak on it, we'd love to hear that. Yeah, again. I'd love to hear more what she thinks about that. And I, I enjoyed her presentation and learned so much, by the way, as well. So thank you for that, Dr. Khalil. Um, but, but definitely, I mean, I think that's such an important conversation in our country. You know, you think that things have changed. I mean, as I said, you know, I was born a while ago and things had not, things were difficult. And some of those remain the same, I have found, even with my Howard students. So we're, we're often engaged in discussions about what is beauty, what is beautiful in this country and others, and how have we come to think the way that we think. So it's definitely an important conversation, I think, for young people as well. And that's why I wanted the grandmother and her explanation to talk about, I love these marks. They're important to me. They make me feel beautiful. And that's what her, why her parents put them on her, you know, to honor her beauty and intelligence and where she was from. So it's definitely, hopefully, it's the start of a conversation. I also like the way the book focused around the grandmother, the Nana, the Abuelo. Uh, any special reason for that? Uh, I just think, well, I wanted to also show, you know, the generations and how in many families, the grandmother or the grandfather may live there. My grandfather lived with us for a long time. After my grandmother died, he came and lived with us. And my grandparents were just so important to me. My grandmother used to, she had a lot of grandchildren, but she'd make time for all of us. 
And I remember I'd be so excited about the days when I was going to go. I lived in Boston. So there was a store called Filene's Basement. That was a big deal. And it was a big deal to go there with her. I could get one thing, <laughs> but I loved it. It was so special. So I really wanted to represent that, the specialness of that relationship. I don't have any grandchildren yet, but those of my friends who do tell me it's so different from, you know, just being a parent that it's really quite special. So hopefully one day I'll be so blessed. <laughs> That'll be Okay, I think Dr. Rabia Khalil would like to speak. We'll give her oh, the floor. Great. Oh, yes. And thank you so much for that wonderful reading of your text, as well as all of the explanations you've provided us. And um, I was just making connections, you know, back to the book that, that I studied, you know, for this presentation, Hayun's text. And, yes. and he did often mention how um, this sort of glamorous era of Egyptian cinema really celebrated um, the Western look, mm. um, even though it was e Egyptian cinema. Right. So when we think of Egypt, maybe there are a couple of different versions of Egypt that we have in our collective imagination, you know, um, and one of those Egypts, I would say, is very whitewashed. Yeah. And it says here in the text um, that Dida's favorite film was Garam Wa Intikam, Love and Revenge, the second and last movie star, the diva Asmahan, a Syrian Egyptian actress who wore Western dresses and styled her jet black hair in the fashion of Western pinup girls. Photos of my grandmother in Paris at the time show that she'd modeled herself on her, an Arab woman trying to present as European. In those times, as in ours, the standards of beauty were white. Yeah. So we can't really, I think in all of these discussions, leave out how important aesthetics becomes in these stories and how our children, some of whom are black and brown in this discussion, consume this literature, just yeah. as you were talking about in your introduction of, of how the first stories you began to tell were not stories of people who look like you. Right, yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the things when I first traveled to the continent, I first went to Senegal, um, and at that time, actually my aunt was the ambassador of Senegal under Bill Clinton. But in any case, I was so excited to go. And there, there was so much of it I loved, especially getting off the plane with Welcome Home. I mean, I was just in tears. But one of the things I was struck by was how many African women had bleached their skin to the point where their skin was burnt. And I, it was so upsetting to me. And I really had to really think about that and what that means. And, you know, um, yeah, so you're right. You're absolutely right. So we have to do our work. <laughs> Thank you. I was just thinking as part of that conversation, uh, who, who was the famous movie star that played Cleopatra? Uh, oh, quite a bit. Elizabeth she Taylor. Like Elizabeth Taylor, that, yeah, uh, yeah Dr. Oh, uh, goodness. <laughs> comment. I uh, just want to check back to the chat. If you have questions, please put them forth. Um, there's been a comment that after the Q&A, uh, that uh, the audience uh, participants will be placed in the breakout groups to discuss what they've learned which has been quite a lot, I'm sure, from the presentations and how they could use this in their classrooms. So mm -hmm. we are going to wrap up with that. We'd like to thank you, uh, Tricia Liam Walker and all of our presenters today. You've done an excellent job and we're looking forward to the results of our breakout room. So I'll hand it back over to the moderators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen, Dr. for your wonderful um, Q&A sessions that you did with all of the presenters. Yes, that thank you. A big job. You thank did you. some very heavy lifting, and we thank you so much. It enriched the whole much workshop a great deal. We do also want to make sure before we constitute the breakout groups that you return because um, the last thing we will do today is fill out an evaluation form, which will also be your passport to receiving a free book um, through Barnes and Noble. And we will explain that, but please don't go too early. Uh, come back after the breakout groups and fill out that evaluation form. <clears throat> Is everybody back from the breakout rooms? I think so. Well, before we get to the evaluations, and I want to show you how to do that, um, does anybody, would, would anybody like to unmute themselves and kind of share what they talked about in their 
in their breakout rooms, kind of share anything, uh, anything interesting that you learned or that you'd want people to know about. You can just unmute yourself and speak if you like. I'd like to share just briefly. We had a, a of course, everyone is wealth uh, knowledge and you know educator in some capacity. But one, a couple of the sisters were, one was a professor, one was a librarian, and we were all talking about you know different programs connecting the authors, which I thought was really wonderful because um, there is so many things and so many opportunities in this virtual format. It, it kind of gets overwhelming, but um, people are constantly looking as myself, a classroom teacher, trying to figure out ways to engage or the new, uh, the newest literature, you know, trying to infuse as much cultural identities as possible in the classroom. And I was just sharing a couple of ways to use both of these books, you know, being in a school system that is now going to recognize Ramadan, then I can, you know, possibly use the Arabic quilt to talk about some of that culture. Um, Nana Kuya goes to school and use that in our Malian unit where we talk about the Adinkra symbols and so forth. So we are all just sharing, you know, so many ways in which you could use this literature. I thank you all for this opportunity. Always enjoy it. Thank you, Natalie. I'll give a chance for maybe one more person to say, to, to share something. And in the meantime, I'll put the evaluation, the, the link to the evaluation into the chat. Oh, I think I didn't put it to everybody. Olivia, would you like to share? Sure, sure. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Olivia Enda. I am a junior pre-service teacher at Howard University. Um, I really did enjoy just sitting in and absorbing all the different information here today, um, specifically just playing on my identity as a first-generation American whose parents actually immigrated from Ghana. It was really nice to um, see the integration of resources, tools, um, on various levels from elementary school students to middle and high school students and how um, that whole idea of intersection um, of identity can be utilized in the classroom and really just have a culturally aware and culturally diverse um, classroom library or just vocabulary for the students. Um, and even for the teachers or other pre-service teachers or coworkers or fellow facilitators or just general stakeholders in the um, education realm. Um, is really important to ensure that um, everyone is really aware and inclusive um, because of growing up in a predominantly white community um, in Western Massachusetts, it was far from, um, but yes, in our breakout room, we really did um, highlight the ideas of identity and allowing students specifically to be able to tell their story um, and really priding them in their individuality of that story. Wonderful, thank you so much, Olivia, for that. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the, to the document that's in the chat. So this will help us first, first of all, confirm your attendance, but it'll also give us a chance to mail you the book. So what you'll see once you click on it, it'll kind of list the different books that are uh, options there. You can click on one, fill out the rest of the form, and we'll go from there and we'll send this and then the bookstore, the Howard University bookstore will send you the book of your choice. Uh, but before we go, I do want to show you an event that we have been planning and Brenda chime in at any time. I will share my screen so that you can see. And with the Librarian of Congress. All right. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, thank you, uh, Susan. Thank you, Anya, for handling everything in the background. Thank you, all the authors, the presenters. Thank you, audience, for your questions, your engagement, and seeing you and hearing from you. This was a wonderful way to spend our Saturday. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great week. Have a great week and a great weekend. <laughs>